speaking of uh, Harry Potter. I thought yeah. you were going to say speaking of Wizard Hitler. <laughs> well, speaking of Wizard Hitler. <laughs> Ben McKenzie. Welcome to Pratt Chat, the monthly Terry Pratchett book club podcast. Each month we discuss one of Terry Pratchett's books with a special guest. This month we're discussing Guards Guards, which is about the haves, the have-nots, and the have-locks. And our guest is writer, performer, and librarian Amy Nichols. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. It is lovely to have you here. It's lovely to be here. I've known you as a Pratchett fan for a long time. Yeah. I I can't remember when we first talked about it. I think we talked at one point, but I also remember um, you sending me a really lovely message about the uh, Facebook post that I wrote when Pratchett passed away. Yes. Um, And we had a big chat about that for a while. So I think that was probably the defining bonding moment, I think. When did you start reading Pratchett? I've been reading them for a really long time. I found my first Pratchett book uh, in the school library uh, early on in year seven. So I was 12. So I've now been a Pratchett fan for much longer in my life than I haven't been a Pratchett fan. And, and yes, yeah, so that was um, Mort and I picked it up because I quite liked the uh, Josh Kirby covers. Well, I liked that one in particular. I have mixed feelings about some of them. And mm. yeah, read the blurb and was just in hysterics in the library. So I'm like, yeah, this is coming home with me. <laughs> Are you Excellent. allowed to be in hysterics in the library? I was in really good with the librarians, so I got away with it. I feel like school is divided into if you're in good with the librarians and if you're not, and your experience is very different depending on which camp you're in. I think so too, and people always think of you know of school cliques as like you know the jocks and the nerds and the popular kids or whatever, but no, it's all about the school librarians. Yeah. They're the best people in the world. And if you're in good with them, they'll let you borrow books that other kids aren't allowed to borrow. Absolutely. Or they even bring their own books from home mm. if you want something that the school library doesn't have. It's always very good. Well, look, we are here to discuss Guards, Guards. <laughs> and so we should begin, as we so often do, with a reading of the blurb. This is where the dragons went. They lie, not dead, not asleep, but dormant. And although the space they occupy isn't like normal space, nevertheless they are packed in tightly. They could put you in mind of a can of sardines, if you thought sardines were huge and scaly. And presumably, somewhere, there's a key. Now, I also want to read, like, you know, they usually just read the blurb bit, and that's quite ominous. I mean, it's also basically just the first passage yeah, of the book. Yeah, that's so real very lazy, lazy blurbing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it also says, Guards, Guards is the eighth Discworld novel, and I don't know how telling you it's the eighth something is supposed to make you want to read it. But then it says, and after this, dragons will never be the same again. <laughs> I don't know how true that is. <laughs> how do you, true do you feel that is? I don't know, but as a quick side point, did we know that our eighth episode was the eighth book? Well, Ooh. I think you mean our seven eighths Ooh. episode. Eight is the magical number, though. Yeah, so like That's... it just sort of was meant to be. Yeah, clearly. Well, I mean, we didn't we didn't plan it that way, but well, it we happened. didn't plan to be recording on the glorious twenty fifth of May either. No, mm. we, do, we should explain that to any listeners who don't know about the twenty fifth of May. So the glorious twenty fifth of May refers to the revolution, for want of a better word, um, that takes place when uh, Sam Vimes is. A young Lance Constable, so uh, the Sam Vimes that we meet in Guards Guards has already been informed by the young Sam of Nightwatch. And seemingly forgotten a whole lot of everything that happened to him in that book. He's too busy bustling through all his film references, I think. (laughs) That's true. That's true. Well, I think we'll we'll get to that. I think we'll get to that. Um, But the 25th of May is also an important date for fans of another author because it is Towel Day today. When we remember the late, great Douglas Adams, who, you know, it was kind of my gateway, as I've said on the podcast before, to Pratchett. And it is quite an Adamsy Pratchett book. I it is. Not, it that, is. not that he's got the market cornered on, oh, no, not again, but like he also kind of does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he does express the ultimate, oh, no, not again, I feel. Yeah. 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 Uh, but this book, like we just said, does open with 
pretty much the blurb uh, telling us that the dragons live somewhere else and then taking us straight into the streets of Ankh-Morpork where we meet as our first character. The, and he's, he's described this way, drunken Captain Vimes of the Night Watch. Vimes is not quite... I mean, we, we started off the podcast with Men at Arms and even by the second time we meet him, he's a much more fully formed character than here. He's a bit... How did you find going back to Vimes' origins? He is like a lot of stereotypes strapped together with something likable that mm. later evolves into a more Vimesy shape because I think a lot of his attitudes are sort of like, they're like the seedlings of what's going to come, but in particular his interactions with Sybil are not really kind of the character that we come to know later, not just because their relationship evolves, but because it just doesn't seem like how he'd handle the situation to me. I think that's a really good point sort of about the stereotypes like he feels like very brought on from you know hard-boiled detective kind of things I do think in the context of the other City Watch books it's a good book for um, setting up Vimes's personal demons and so what Mm. he is actually overcoming and developing from in the later books as well because yeah he's kind of at like the trough of coping with things he's got a consistent ethics throughout so maybe this is the him when he's just trying to squash out who he really is so maybe it's accurate it's the the tamp down version of him and yeah i think so and i'd sort of forgotten as well that um part of the reason the night watch has been so defanged is through the rise of the guilds and how the guilds have come to sort of police themselves and all of that sort of thing like it had been a few well, probably more than a few years since I'd read the books, so I'd sort of forgotten that detail. And in the context of the city politics and veterinary and all of that sort of thing, I think that becomes really important. And I found myself thinking, hang on, yeah, with all these guilds, what does the Night's Watch do? And yeah. I tried to remember later books and I was like, hang on. And then I spent far too long just sort of squinting off into the distance, not coming up with an answer. It's a really, well, because like in later books, it really kind of, it's such a good setup for a police drama because they don't have to deal with any petty crimes because the guilds deal with those. Mm. Like if someone's being murdered and they're not allowed to be being murdered, the assassins are probably onto it. If someone's being robbed and that's not official, the thieves guild is onto that. So really the laws that they're policing are like the big things, the conspiracies, the, the dangerous threats to the entire city. And that kind of, you know, obviously it starts with this book but it becomes the real theme that they never investigate anything that's not like, you know, of at least city level importance, um, which is, you know, interesting in a way because there's so much about the everyday people and they are everyday people, particularly in this book. And they care so much about the everyday people, but they're not really involved in, you know, everyday crimes, but they, I think they care about those bigger crimes because they understand the impact it's going to have on the everyday people. So yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic that gets set up here. And and you're right, I'd totally forgotten as well that the you know, one of the reasons for Vimes' misery is that he's in this post in the Night Watch and no one cares about the Night Watch anymore because they're just totally unnecessary in most ways. So they spend all their time drinking and shouting about how all's well. <laughs> That's about all they do at this stage when we when the book begins. I also like how the first time uh, that Ank Morpork is described in the book, it's called the oldest and greatest and grubbiest of cities. <laughs> uh, and it's just such a succinct, wonderful way to describe Ank Morpork. And even now, even by book eight of the Discworld series, you can describe it in those three words. And we, we know, we know exactly where we are and what's going on. Mm. Um, I, I got a bit distracted actually when I was reading because this copy of the book, and I don't know if yours is the same, has numbered footnotes, whereas all the other ones I'd had had asterisks that mine had asterisks this one's got numbered ones and i think it's because when you get up to some of the dwarf speak there's like at one point there's four footnotes on the same page for four different lines of dwarf dialogue explaining what it means so and, and you've got the the most recent paperback edition with mm. a variant of the kirby cover and amy you've got the you've got the fancy adult cover with the the classy photograph down with adult covers. Um, this does have asterisks. Yours has got asterisks as well. So there you go. So that's why I found that really a bit, a bit off-putting because I find the asterisks so friendly and comfortable. Uh, and now there's just numbers there. It felt a bit more academic. Were they at least in um, in trollish? Like did it go like many many? Uh, <laughs> that would be great, wouldn't it? Um, footnote many. Uh, <laughs> no, it's uh, they're many just, many. Just just one. Uh, they never go above four because there's never more than four on a page. But yeah. so maybe it is. No. Well, if there was more than four, then that would be lots. Mm. 
What actually speaking of footnotes, one of the things that I thought was interesting. I mean, the first footnote in the book is a great one because it sort of introduces the physics behind L space. It doesn't use L space. That doesn't come until quite a bit later in the book, but it, it does describe that dynamic of knowledge equals power equals energy equals matter equals mass. And you're like, oh, that's that's like one of those great things where they mix up like an aphorism with actual physics <laughs> and it kind of makes sense and i loved it so much and in fact even in the dedication of the book i don't know if this is in your editions but um in part it's dedicated apart from being dedicated to the palace guard the city guard or you know those guys always get killed in all these novels it's also dedicated to mike harrison mary gentle neil gaiman and all the others who assisted with and laughed at the idea of l space um, too bad we never used Schrodinger's paperback. Now I'm, <laughs> I'm intrigued about that. I'm going to have to look up that and see what that was all about. We should write them a letter. We should. Yeah. We could. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed that first footnote. But I also enjoyed that instead of being explained in a footnote, the librarian's state as uh, an orangutan is explained in the text. And he has quite a large role in this book, which mm. I really enjoyed too. Yeah. Do you? How do you feel about the librarian, Amy, as a librarian? I love the librarian. Yeah. Mm. I yeah, absolutely. I still remember um one of the first times I ever went to a professional conference. I think it might have actually been the first professional conference I went to and there was a person there who was a librarian who was wearing a librarian t-shirt and I was like <laughs> you are instantly one of my people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um I, nerd flagging. Mm. Yeah. Uh and there's a whole bit of business there. There's, it's I quite like how at the start and at the end, it becomes a lot of very short scenes. So there's lots of stuff that's happening. It starts setting it up and at the end, it's like just really ramps up and um, it's got a really good pace, I think, this book. Yeah, because we've got Sad Vimes drunk after the death of someone in Night's Watch, which oh, is Gaskin. Not, yeah, not yeah. explained properly at that point. Mm. And he's getting really drunk. He's in the gutter. We've got the dragons that have been mentioned earlier. We've met the librarian and something's going on with the books, sort of. Someone's stealing something from and- somewhere. And then there's a knock at a door and a mysterious conversation that becomes progressively less mystical and cultish as it goes along. Yeah. This this section reminded me of Get Smart more than anything else. Like mm. all this sort of exchanging of secret passwords that then becomes, are you sure that's not the right one? <laughs> Isn't it about the whales? No, it's not. Yeah, really Get Smart. I really liked it. I could really envision it as like a, a classic Python skit. The cadence to me is very reminiscent of the argument sketch Mm. oh yeah yeah as it just escalates and it's got that sort of you know taking what you expect and then punctuating it and saying this is ridiculous no it's not Uh, (laughs) you find what it is uh yeah (laughs) thanks thanks for that one Liz. Uh, yeah so um but then um brother fingers as we find out he's called gets in via the portal and they have a discussion and interestingly i wrote in my notes something that was one of the comments that we got via Twitter about the book, is that even from this very first meeting of the, and I want to get their name right. The the elucidated. Elucidated brethren of the Ebon Knight. Is that, is that them? I always get. Or are they the other brethren? I can (laughs) get. Or are they the folk dancing troupe? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) That was a great reveal later on as well. Uh, But yeah, no, the elucidated brethren of the Ebon Knight. I, immediately, I was the way that the Grand Master is manipulating these men, because they are all men, and I don't, don't think that's insignificant, getting them to think about all their little petty grievances in their lives and aiming them at someone else and saying, these people are to blame for your misfortune and here's something you can do about it. Yeah, it just really reminded me of groups like, you know, the more extreme end of, of men's rights activism or, you know, like incels. Um, and even, like, in particular, some of the later scenes even more so, um, you know, the kind of rhetoric around the rise of Trump in the US. Yeah, I thought that was a really good quote um, in the first meeting, which was, there was a thoughtful pause in the conversation as the assembled brethren mentally divided the universe into the deserving and the undeserving and put themselves on the appropriate side. And that is just at the heart of so much wrong in the world. Like you can just, you draw a line and then you put yourself on the side that's more desirable, irrespective of what reality is actually about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it is a bit of an evergreen kind of thing because when I was rereading it, I was like, oh, this feels very, very current. And I wasn't thinking specifically of incels, but yeah, I can definitely agree with that. But also looking at so-called alt-right kind of groups Mm -hmm. and all of that sort of thing that's around at the moment. Um, my, um, just getting back slightly on this point, my blurb, um, for the edition of the book that I have actually specifically deals with the elucidated brethren first, because it's got a 
that great quote about being oppressed by not being allowed to play their trumpet. <laughs> um, but the opening line of the actual blurb is, an aura of mean-spirited resentfulness is thick in the streets of Ankh-Morpork. Pork. And I just think yeah. that mean-spirited resentfulness is like a brilliant summation of what's going on in this book and also why those characters resonate so much at the moment and i think it's also a human thing that that's always lurking somewhere it just takes the right person or the wrong person at the right time to prod it into a flame and that's when you get sort of horrific nationwide worldwide situations yeah as well and this was published in 1989 so it would have been being written in the late 80s so we're talking thatcherite era britain Uh, so you can see the parallels there and it is yeah it just does it did feel like surprisingly current yeah Mm. oh and it probably and, will just keep feeling that way forever, which is depressing. Yeah. <sighs> and the mysterious Supreme Grandmaster who's so – he's just very well aware of this. Like he is totally manipulating them. There's no – he doesn't buy into it. He's just using it to get these idiots. And he always – he keeps referring to how all the other, you know, secret societies have all the good, you know, cultists and he's got the idiots who are left over. Um, but he knows that and he's like, that's fine for my purposes. I can manipulate them and get them to do whatever I want. I'm really sorry to be the person who's like, oh, I've guessed the murder in the Agatha Christie book in the first three pages. But um, even though I'd read it before, it was really obvious to me who he was going to turn out to be from very early on. Yeah. And I, don't know, I just wanted to see what you both thought of that because I was kind of like, oh, it's definitely this person. I, and I remember thinking that previously. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I can't remember if I figured it out myself. Um, I think that the big clues in the text don't come until quite later in the book. Uh, and I did remember who it was. So I, the whole time I was reading the book, I knew who it was going to turn out to be. So I just don't know. What, do you, what about you, Annie? Yeah, I can't really remember, um, like in comparison with previous times, fairly, like I think within the first scene I went, oh, yeah, I remember who this is. Because, um, again, I'd kind of forgotten. But I didn't find it super heavy-handed. But, yeah, obviously mm. as time goes on a bit more, there's some yeah, I'd- much bigger clues dropped. I do read a lot of murder mysteries and watch a lot of murder shows, so I'm probably always looking out. <laughs> I've probably said this before. It's like the thing where they, where you have a celebrity playing a bit part. You're like, oh, well, they're either the red herring or the murderer. And his Lupine Wants' role seemed too big for just what it was hmm. early on. And also his name. And basically for me, the thing that cemented it when I originally read it, I mean, this all came back to me in a in a wave of smugness as I, <laughs> as I was rereading it's it this time. It's appropriate. Because yeah. um, when... Because the Grand Master is the one who knows that the dragon has come when no one else has seen it because of the mental connection that they later sort of explain. And I was kind of like, oh, well, so he is the dragon or he's at least connected with the dragon. Lupine, werewolf, I know it's... So yeah. it kind yeah. of, the name was also, I was like, it has to be. Otherwise, this is a waste of really good naming. Yeah. Mm. And that scene where uh, Vimes goes to see the patrician and speaks with Wands and it's there's that whole thing where he talks about their background where they both grew up in the shades and you're thinking that's a lot of background for a character who's like the guy who's the attendant to the patrician and I again I don't know if that would have tweaked me when I first read it and I had not read a lot of murder mysteries when I first read this book uh, so I have no idea if I worked it out back then certainly I wouldn't have at the start I don't think but it is it does feel a bit like why is this guy getting so much backstory <laughs> uh, but I kind of like that because you don't otherwise find out a lot until much later books about Vimes's youth. Mm. And even then you find out about his youth in The Watch. You don't really find out what it was like when he was growing up. There's just sort of this generic description of him being poor. But in this one, it's like, no, he grew up in the shade. It's like he comes from the rough side of town. But with a clean house, because that was always very important. Yes. Yep. Yes. But um, while this is all happening, someone is making their approach from the country because they've just found out that they're not who they thought they were. And this is Corporal Carrot. Or at that point, Dwarf Carrot, who finds out he's adopted and not a dwarf at all. Yeah, oh, that scene was so delightful. The bit where he's talking with his dad, who's the king, like the the mine supervisor. <laughs> oh, I thought that was so great. Oh. Oh, the bit where he's like, he doesn't understand even when he's told that he's found toddling in the woods. He's like, oh, well, that that's where babies come from, isn't it? Because <laughs> dwarves yeah. don't find out. No, not until they're yeah. like 55. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're properly grown up. Yeah. Because gender is optional for dwarves. Mm. I thought that was really interesting. That also felt like surprisingly like pertinent to our times and that they have one pronoun because they don't really bother with genders until they want to make little dwarves. And even then, you know, that they sort of get it over with quickly and get mm. back to the mine because everyone's got beards and everyone is just doing their thing. They're all just dwarves. Mm. Yeah. 
It was kind of lovely. Yeah. Although you do have, because of course there's Minty Rock mm. Smasher. Oh, min- minty Rock Smacker, yeah. Smacker, yes. Yeah. The, uh, the love interest to character gets into trouble several times a day Mm -hmm. um Mm. and so it was actually um a bit jarring for me to be seeing feminine pronouns used for a a dwarf Mm. yeah that was weird because in the book it specifically says they just use the one and And then in the same section even they just switched to yeah Yeah. Mm. you know the other weird thing about this is they never name carrot's adoptive parents when he's talking to his dad, he's, it's always referred to as the dwarf or the king mm, mm. or the mind supervisor. They never say his name. And I'm like, how can we never know Carrot's father's name? I mean, presumably his um, surname is Iron Founder's son, although I don't think even that is used at all, even for Carrot in this book. I don't well, remember no, saying it's it. No, it's not. Or could he just be Iron Founder? Oh, and then Carrot's like, oh. well, except all the dwarfs have names that are like Iron Founder's son or Strong in the Arm or... Mm. So, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I, I just found that really weird because and particularly when there's that whole joke about how when he's talking to the uh, human that he knows and he says, and Bob's your uncle, and he goes, uh, no, Bjorn's strong in the arms, my uncle. And you're like, <laughs> okay, you're going to name Carrot's father's uncle yeah. but not Carrot's father. It just seemed really odd. Mm. Made him a bit of a generic dwarf, I guess, was, was probably the point. But I also found it interesting that when Carrot, skipping slightly ahead, starts writing letters back to his parents, the language is much better than in subsequent books. Like, it's the city has really made his writing worse. Yeah, (laughs) it has. (laughs) But so um, he finds out he's not a dwarf. His dad's telling him that there's no life for him having to stoop at these four-foot mines anymore, so he's going to get him the most noble job in the city. He's going to be a man of the night's watch. Yeah. And so he writes him a letter, sends him off with the one human who comes by every so often and then carries is off to the city. Uh, and I like they really emphasise how much of a huge strapping lad Carrot is. Like he's six foot six or something and he's almost as broad as he is tall. And there's that great line about when he's on his way and it says people like Carrot often have uneventful journeys. <laughs> nobody's <laughs> going to try and waylay him. If people jump out from behind rocks and go, oh, sorry, I thought you were someone else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I really like that. And it just sort of... because. It's easy to forget how young he is. Mm. And Carrot can't have been in the city more than a week or two during the events of this book. So he really kind of comes into his own very, very quickly. But in this book, he is much more of a, a bumbling youth from the from the mountains. Yeah, it's almost as though he's like born to the city in some ways. Like he somehow mm. has some kind of legacy connection to it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite mysterious. <laughs> yeah, can't think why. No. Yeah. Anyway, him and his sword and his birthmark go on the way to... <laughs> Oh, and his, and his protective. Mm. And, oh, oh, yes. And his copy of the laws and regulations of Ankh Morpork, which is heavily out of date, you know, because dwarves are not good with metaphors. And someone says, you know, would do, do a man good to read this book cover to cover. He literally tries reading the whole thing and memorizing it, mm. um, which, you know, comes in handy later on. Or does it? I don't know. Yeah, it, it certainly catalyzes some things. That's true. But as he's heading towards the city, and we go back to Ankh Morpork in the narrative. The brethren have decided to enact their plan. They gather some magical objects, put them in a little circle. They have the book that Brother Fingers has stolen, and the Grandmaster intones the the words. Apparently, they're they're very short. We never find out what they actually are. Probably for the best, <laughs> just in case they work. I suppose. I like the way that they describe it because when they do summon the dragon, the master sort of it it describes the master full of fire and. And, mm. uh, and anger he become he doesn't become a dragon but his sort of mind controls the dragon he's sort of in the pilot seat as it were yeah, yeah. it's kind of like the the blue people from avatar and their ikran connected oh yeah but yeah, not as horrible yeah not as gross as that that's yeah. really weird <laughs> yeah sorry we're not going to get into how terrible that <laughs> that relationship is but no. <laughs> no let's not maybe it's more like in Anne mccaffrey's books how the dragon riders have connections with their dragons so, like, if something happens to one, the other is affected. That kind of thing. Mm. But when they first summon the dragon, it does incinerate someone. And there's that great bit where it's this, it's the thief, Muti. He says, oh, shit, and died. And then he does later on say, t- <laughs> like, he gets to finish his uh, expletive <laughs> as he meets death. And that was, you know, death's first cameo in the book. You know, and Muti's, like, so impressed. He's like, oh, I didn't know you showed up for people like me. And he says, I turned up for everyone. No, I met in person sort of things. He goes, sometimes on special occasions. <laughs> I'm just sad because, like, people aren't going to know he's dead. 
no one's ever going to know. Cause First he, person killed by a dragon in 200 years, nobody knows. Yeah, because he's just a pile of ash. There's not like the, the mm. mural sort of thing for him. And he seems like he hasn't got that many loved ones. So they could just think he's scarpered. Mm. And that's kind of sad to me. Yeah. That is sad. And he's like, he seems quite nice for a thief. Yeah. And I think he's a registered thief. Yeah. It's kind of like in Lord of the Flies. You know, spoilers for Lord of the Flies, if anyone... Um, oh, when I, Pig- hate, I hate the book, spoil away. So um, when Piggy dies, as is a big thing... Um, when the guys come at the end of the thing, they've set the whole jungle on fire. They could get away with that. They don't have to tell them that Piggy ever survived the plane crash. So, like, it could be as though he never happened. And that's kind of how I felt about Mooty. Like, yeah. his life was kind of a moot point. Oh. oh. Or he's mooted. That is, sad. <laughs> that is really sad. So, yeah, just to um, put a dampener on the whole death thing that happened. <laughs> but I do, like, I do like the way that he says, Caught. Like, it reminded me of, like, the British comics I used to read when I was a kid. Like, Big Comic and Wizard and Chips. Like, they were always saying that. And I used to say it and nobody knew what the hell I was talking about because I was the only one I knew who read them. Uh, but that comes back because one of the brethren also reacts the same way when he goes, yeah, we've summoned a dragon. He goes, oh, we did it. We summoned a dragon. He's like, they're so excitable. They're like teenagers. If only they weren't so horrible. Well, they're like in Buffy, the triad of, like, the... the- the geeks that keep doing evil. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. And there's one that's like properly evil and the others are kind of like, oh, it'd be good if we could make a robot girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. Like it kind of has that vibes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They're, and again, you know, he's manipulating them and turning their grievances against people whose fault it isn't. And again, that's another, like such a big um, correlation to, you know, incels and all that kind of stuff as well. But um, Gross. now that we've talked about a thief getting incinerated, we're going to skip to the highest level thief who is suddenly found arrested and tied up outside the palace. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because Carrot, having entered the city, um, saved a young woman from getting robbed um, and been offered anything he wants on the house and turning it down because it didn't have any apples, has now <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. set about putting into order all of the laws that he's learned. So he arrests the head of the Thieves Guild, not knowing that that's not what you do. We don't actually see his swearing in. He just sort of, he goes and finds Vimes drunk in a pub somewhere and Vimes like says something and then forgets about it because he's drunk. And then, yeah, this is his first official act. It's like, what do you mean there's a thieves guild? It's kind of like in Black Books where um, Bernard Black hires Manny while drunk and doesn't remember the next day. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's very similar. Very similar. So I'm just piecing together this book out of clips of other things, <laughs> <laughs> bit by bit. <laughs> this is actually the scene that we've already alluded to where Vimes goes to see the patrician to explain and has the discussion with Lupine and we find out about their shared heritage. And also they mention insurance uh, or in sewer ants, mm-hmm. which I don't think has been mentioned in the book since uh, The Colour of Magic. And this is where they explain you know, the fall of the watch and the rise of the Thieves Guild and the other guilds as well. But there's also a few clues in here as to why Vimes is drinking so much all the time. But there's not, it's not, it's not really explained. And I think even by the end of the book, they don't really tell you why that is. Like there's, there's some, Colin has an explanation and you're not really sure. And you're not sure. They keep alluding to a couple of things from his past that they never fully explain. Mm. But they head back to the, the watch. Carrot writes another letter home. There's a joke about Carrot being a diversity hire. There's this thing where like he says, oh, I thought you were making an ethnic joke yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, Give this dwarf a short lesson in what it means to be a guard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Vimes can't remember him. He's mm. like, oh, w- wait, I thought he was a bit tall for a dwarf. Was he a dwarf? <laughs> uh, which is, you know, obviously a repeated uh, thing that happens. Now, this is one of the, uh, when they go back to the watch house after Carrot writes his second letter, this is where we see one of the puns that um, I've forgotten about in the book, which is the old Morporkian motto of the night watch. You you were quite tickled by this, weren't you, Amy? Uh, yes. No, I, I'd also forgotten about this one. And, yeah, I was quite pleased to see that it was... Uh, <laughs> Fabricati DM punk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Which they claim means um, to protect and serve. <laughs> Old Morporkian bears as much resemblance to Latin as Austin Powers does to James Bond. It's lovingly crafted with all the same ingredients, but very obviously taking the piss. Fabricati DM punk is, I can't believe it's not Latin, for make my day punk. Clint Eastwood's most famous line in the cop action movie, Sudden Impact. This is where we learn more about the other members of the Watch who hitherto have been kind of mentioned in passing. We don't really know anything about them. This is where we learn about Fred Colin and Nobby Nobbs. Um, not that I don't think you ever learned Nobby's last name 
in this book, no. do you? He's just only ever referred to as Nobby. There's a bit of that going around in this <laughs> book, isn't there? Which is funny. Like, is he secretly like really high born? Because like a knob is. There are a lot of hints of that yeah. in the books, and in fact, I think I think in one of the others, it's quite explicitly suggested that his um, sort of he's descended from some very high up nobility, but you know, obviously they've fallen very far. But even in this book, there's a line when he talks to one of the guards later in the book. He's talking to them like he knows them. And he mentions that this guy used to run errands for his grandfather when mm. he was a kid. And you're like, why did your grandfather have people running errands for him? <laughs> like, yeah. who was he? What was that deal? And they don't, they, that's, it's just mentioned in passing. So you're like, uh. so I think even here, maybe Pratchett had already thought that that would be somewhere he wanted to take the Nobs character. Yeah. And things like, you know, his secret love of folk dancing and... Yeah, um, Morris dancing specifically, pretty much. They don't say it, but, yeah. like, it's Morris dancing. They mention yeah. the bells and the bits of wood. Yeah. yeah. We yeah. know what they're talking about. And it's funny because you can literally pull the other one that has got bells on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how do we feel about, about the other members of the Watch? Because this is where we meet them properly for the first time. I feel like he's nailed Colin from the beginning. Like, he's consistent throughout. He's got his relationship with his wife... Loves food. He's got that military history that's interesting, but yeah, he's just a bit gone to seed. Absolutely. I think Nobby probably gets a bit more character development throughout the series and, you know, has some great minor plot lines in several of the other books. But um, you're still sort of getting a really good setup of essential Nobbiness mm. here, I think. <laughs> Not me, the social, was it social mountaineer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And there was something about him, you know, the lowest common denominator yes. because it doesn't get any more common than Nobby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because everyone seems to like him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mysteriously. Mm. Which is a bit mysterious because, you know, the, in, in Men at Arms, even in the blurb, he's described as having been disqualified from the human race for shoving, you know. <laughs> and I, I, there's never, you know, I, I was expecting to get a really good physical description of him in this mm. book because there didn't seem to be one in Men at Arms. And I'm like, what am I supposed to imagine that he looks like? And they occasionally refer to the fact that he had to carry around a bit of paper to prove that he was a human being. Yeah. But even in this book, he doesn't really say what he looks they, like. Do they say like he's like four foot with the muscle tone of an elastic band or yeah. something like that? Yeah, like he's short and skinny and kind mm. of pigeon chested and, and a bit weird looking. Yeah, yeah, not pleasant to look at. I think is the connotation there. Yeah, oh, I did find that there is a description of Nobby in here, and in fact, uh, we were talking about at the start. This is quite an Adamsy kind of book in some ways. There's a very Adamsy line. He was a small, bandy legged man with a certain resemblance to a chimpanzee who never got invited to tea parties, mm. <laughs> which just reminded me of that line, you know, about how human beings are very embarrassed by their ancestors and almost never invite them round for tea <laughs> from the first Hitchhiker's book um, and indeed most of the incarnations of it. So, yeah, there's, there's all these hints about what he looks like and, and it's, you know, yeah. Whereas I find it always very easy to imagine Fred Colin. Yeah, in my head. And Nobby, I'm like, I always get slightly different impressions of him from different books. I do remember being impressed with the casting of Nobby in the um, Going Postal telemovie. Mm. Yeah. He's just sort of got a bit of a cameo in that. I don't know the name of the actor, but I remember seeing it and going, that's Nobby. No, that's Nobby. That's that's an excellent choice for Nobby. No, you're right. I remember his face. And I don't think he's that short, that actor. No. But he, no. yeah, he did. He was great. And just, yeah, like the mannerisms that he was using and the facial expressions, I was just like, yep, you have nailed this. I seem to remember he was quite cross-eyed at one point. Yeah, Yeah. I remember. And a bit, maybe a little bit buck-toothed as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, So basically Carrot starts causing a whole bunch of trouble by enforcing the law and not sort of following the politics and discretion of things. Meanwhile, a dragon keeps appearing and disappearing and it takes a while for people to notice that that's happening. The way that it comes to light is that Carrot's got an fight they're trying to take him home oh yes because he went into the mended drum while he was on patrol with nobby who was trying to show him the ropes Um, which is where we first hear this idea that vimes was brung low by a woman Mm -hmm. and nobby thinks that's what's happened to carrot as well because he mentions minty rock smack and cherche la femme yeah (laughs) yes pronounced uh, as spelt as it is pronounced in english more or less Um, um yeah but to me i thought that could be that's what Nobby thinks has happened to everyone, so it's not necessarily an indicator of what has happened to Vimes. Mm. Um, so basically, Carrot gets into this massive fight while the rest of the watch stands outside sort of going, oh, well, it's a shame, but he wouldn't have really liked it on the watch. Um, we'll, we'll go in once once it's all done. Yeah. He seemed like a nice lad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, such a shame. But then it seems like he's winning, and so they go in, and he sort of 
bust out a line ending in the fact that, and he hasn't even seen one one single rope as he was promised to be shown, and then he collapses. Yeah. And then they sort of force some alcohol into him, force some alcohol into themselves, and accidentally find themselves in the shades, about to be murdered by a group of six people. Yes. But then they're saved by <laughs> a dragon. The dragon, hooray! <laughs> Everyone's supposed to chime in, but I'm not. I'm not good at. I don't go to sports, so I don't. I don't have the the voice that makes people, you know, do a cheer or a, <laughs> or a, or like or the, the the wave that goes around the stadium. So also, I feel like cheering for a dragon is a theme in the book, and maybe we don't want to <laughs> join in. <laughs> well, we'll get into that, but it could be worth cheering the dragon. It depends on why you're cheering. It's yeah, yeah. It's, true. it's not about not cheering the dragon. It's about cheering the road of least resistance and cheering yes. that which is the problem i think dungeons and dragons was definitely an influence on um terry pratchett and he mentions uh when they're about to get stabbed by the thieves um vimes is thinking you know we, i know there's you know there's gods for this and there's gods for that is there a god of coppers somewhere <laughs> like that's going <laughs> to protect us um and he mentions that probably the gods are more interested in someone who's stealing the ruby eye of the earwig king which calls to mind a very famous Dungeons and Dragons illustration from one of the early Dungeon Masters guides of uh, like a big statue of like sort of a goblin shaped thing with ruby eyes and there's like one of the there's a thief like prizing the ruby out of its eye socket while um, other members of the party are fighting off lizard men I think it is downstairs and it's just yeah I was just like he's got to have played d and <laughs> and I, I would so love to have been in one of those <laughs> sessions that would be amazing absolutely there's been more manipulation going on with the brethren as the dragon shows up and incinerates these things. And there's that awful image of, like, he's just seared their shadows onto the wall. See, that it's yeah. supposed to be awful, but unfortunately, I watched a lot of Mr. Bean as a child, and there's that one where he, like, sets off the paint bomb in oh, his house. yeah, to paint and, it. And the guy comes in, t- and there's just the shadow of a man reaching for his hat, set in paint, so the freeze wasn't scary to me in the oh, way no. it should have been. <laughs> Like it's kind of like oh, glowing embers and people all holding daggers about to attack and then they're just sort of incinerated in that moment and it's horrible but it's also hilarious because Mr Bean. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in the aftermath of this is when we, that you know, that they have to go see Veterinary again to report this. The veterinary and... tells them it's a waiting bird. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because <laughs> he comes down to have a look, which is like you know the first time I think in well this is the first book where he plays a really major role because he does show up in sorcery, but he just you know gets turned into a, a newt fairly quickly. He got better. <laughs> he did. He came to get better. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So he kind of does that. Oh yeah. Well, um, don't let anyone get worked up about, about this idea of a dragon. It was probably just a large wading bird, mm. and then Carrot is quickly stopped from arresting him for having something wrong with his carriage. Yes. <laughs> but then the dragon pops up in a way that can't be ignored. Yes, very much so. The third summoning is is the big one because um, it quite surgically incinerates a very particular greengrocer's <laughs> and a very particular coach house. I heard they were quite oppressive. <laughs> yes. Uh, both places, as we know from the earliest meeting of the Brethren, uh, which some of the members had a particular grievance with, and they are incinerated. And even Vimes is like, it's a very considerate dragon. <laughs> um, doesn't like burn half the city down. Just this one particular shop. What would a dragon have against these guys? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, which is which is great, and then everybody, yeah, everybody knows the dragon is there. They've seen it flying through the air, and it happens just after actually Vimes's first meeting with Sybil, because he goes back to the scene of the second summoning and he takes a plaster cast of one of the claw marks. And Colin mentions that, oh yeah, there's the Lady Ramkin. She's mad about dragons, so he goes to meet her, mm. and we get to meet Sybil Ramkin for the first time. And she's very impressive. Mm. She is very impressive. What do we like about Sybil? Because there's so many things to like about her. <laughs> I think the thing, like the way that she's wealthy but doesn't, she uses it for good. Um, she doesn't get hung up on nonsense. She And there's that whole like the rich theory, the Vimes economic theory of boots. Like yeah. she has practical clothes because they're so well made from like three generations ago. Mm. But I don't know, she's, she's using her powers for good. She is just living her life, looking after drag and she doesn't have any hair because it's all been burnt off. Yeah, I've forgotten that detail. Uh, it's ne- I don't think it's ever mentioned again. No. Yeah, I don't think it is either. Uh, but but presumably all the hair that she has throughout the rest of the book. So, unless it grows back because she's not working so directly with the dragons anymore. It gets better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she's just kind of described as this Boadicea warrior type person who just happens to not be fighting in a war at the moment. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's very much what's going on. I don't know, there's uh, there's several moments during the first scene. I mean, there's that whole mix-up where as soon as Vimes opens the door, she's talking about, like, Lord, what's his name? The dra- hmm. And she's talking about a dragon, but he thinks he's talking, she's talking about an actual lord um, <laughs> and how she's going to have to cut his particulars off and, you know, if hmm. he doesn't, you know, do the right thing. And he's like, Adam, I'm afraid I'm going to have to arrest you. <laughs> and she's like, why? It's my bloody dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and I think even prior to that, like, I think her opening the door, that sort of paragraph ends with her like boomingly asking if he knows anything about mating. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It just seems fated to happen, really, Absolutely. doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, although Vimes is not, like in all these early scenes where he and Sybil are interacting, Vimes doesn't show any signs, really, of being attracted to her. It's very weird. Oh, no, something happens to his lower regions. Oh, no, wait, that's an old dragon nuzzling his crotch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was a bit worried about that line as well. And then, uh, yeah, it was the old dragon. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. How do we feel about the start of this relationship? It's realistic in some ways, I think. Like, it's... I feel like they're both people that you're not kind of like, oh, what a catch. They're people that <laughs> once you have them, you're like, I'm so lucky to yeah. have found this person, if that makes sense. They're both kind of rough diamonds in their way, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So you need to kind of pick through that. I think she saw his value faster. Yeah, although we never, I mean, because we never really get any of her internal dialogue. We don't really know what she's thinking. But she does that whole preening herself later when she goes to answer the door. She's Mm. been crying because he's left the house. Like she she falls for him faster. There's those little tender moments too, like when she touches his shoulder and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think about this first meeting though, Amy? Um, I, well, I found it very funny. Like I <laughs> yeah. was just rereading it going, oh, I'd forgotten this as well. And I really enjoyed it. And like, I've got, I've got all the time in the world for Sybil Ramkin. I just love her. Oh, yeah. Um, like it really was a bit of a meet cute kind mm-hmm. of thing. And it, it sets, it's in character for both of them, at least at the time that it's occurring. And even though both characters are like quite new to the reader as well at this point, they're sort of courtship such as it is is very much in character there as well and I don't know that you're not necessarily seeing a lack of interest from Vimes because again well there's yeah that great line where it's actually the dragon under the table the dragon under the table is a new book out by Mills and Boone they're doing a new fantasy line there are so many repeated like lines throughout the books like around um what she looks like and how she carries herself and just how she how she be, basically. And I think, yes, sometimes that's kind of that um, omniscient kind of authorial voice, but Mm. um, I think sometimes it's a little bit more like from the perspective of Vimes and I think particularly a lot of the time with the physical things, like he finds her, you know, possibly a little bit intimidating but is also, I think, quite drawn to her. Then again, I, you know, I'm... (laughs) I'm a very tall lady myself, so it's possible that I'm just kind of, you know, putting my own things on there. I think, yeah, also Vimes is not used to people being kind to him, liking him. He probably is just real suspicious Particularly and not closed the nobility. Off. Mm. Yeah. You know, and even in this book where, as we'll get to, he doesn't quite have the attitude that he has in later books. Yeah. He certainly feels out of his depth going to like the house of like a noble woman and she's not at all what he expects. I think there's a bit of that in there as well. But there's just, there's just a few lines, and it's not in this scene. It's in one of the later ones where he's got that internal thought where he feels like he's creeping out on a plank over an abyss or something as he can kind of feel that something's going to happen between them. That's not how he should feel. Like, that's not a positive way to think about it. And he course also keeps having sort of these fretty freakouts where he thinks that she's, like, propositioning him, but then it turns out she's not. So, like, yeah. when she's looking after him, she's like, you'll have to stay in this bedroom. And then he's like, oh, no, what does that mean? And then she's like, I'll sleep downstairs in the cot where I sleep when the dragons are having eggs. Like, it's- Yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, while they've met, because everybody else is out on errands, <laughs> Nobby and... Colin have been sent to be inconspicuous uh, in other parts. So they've like dressed up uh, and they're referring to each other as not Sergeant Colin, and not Corporal Nobs, which is ridiculous, but I loved it. Uh, so they're off doing that, which means Carrot is left in charge at the watch house and the librarian comes to him mm. to talk about the worst possible crime there could ever be, which is someone has stolen a book from the library. <laughs> what? And uh, there's that great bit where he discovers it's missing by looking at a space where a book is supposed to be. He's like, this is not right. This is not okay. <laughs> I mean, is that how you feel? If there's, Have you ever found a book missing from your library in that way? Many times. It's upsetting. Yeah. And I don't, you know, 
I unfortunately don't have the same talents as the librarian where I can just go absolutely ape. <laughs> I'll crack you ape through your library looking for the culprit. <laughs> I wish I could. It would be a pretty good skill, I It would get the shelving done so quickly. Yeah. Because <laughs> you'd have four, you've got exactly. four hands, basically. Exactly. And you'd never need ladders because you could climb that. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but so he does that, which means um, Carrot's off at the library trying to speak to the librarian. He's one of the characters who doesn't understand what ook means. And I think actually Rincewind's really the main one who does. Uh, and the Vimes other wizards does. actually seems to. And Vimes gets there in the end, although there's definitely a bit of charades going on mm. with him as well. But yeah, there's a whole game of charades where the, the librarian's telling Carrot what the title of the book is. And the dragon, he just can't get dragon. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's like great. a group of my friends were playing Pictionary one time and the word was teamwork. And after like five minutes, they're like, team walk, team walk. <laughs> <laughs> and then the time ran out and it was like, <laughs> that's not a word. <laughs> it's just the charades panics. Uh, I like that, that, you know, they were failing to grasp the term teamwork <laughs> <laughs> as a team. That seems yeah. appropriate. And also they're so sad that team walk could be the correct one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, while all that's going on, that's when the dragon appears the third time and it's, it sets fire to things. Everyone tries to put out the fires, which is hard because you can only get lumps out of the river. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's not long after that when the dragon slayers show up. Not and for long, though. They don't, no. show, they don't stick around because they're like, what do you mean you're not offering half the kingdom and the daughter's hand in marriage? Well, he's got an aunt in Pseudopolis. Yeah, I don't think she's really keen. So my favourite is um, because Vimes is sort of trying to help out. He's like, oh, he's got a dog. And after everyone's sort of left saying $50,000 is not enough, there's one hanging around, like the smart one, who just thinks for a moment and goes, what kind of dog? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You're like, hang on, hold on a minute. What answer would convince you? I don't know. It was a bit creepy. And there's a unicorn hunter who's just there for some reason. But there's also the scene where we meet Cut me own throat, Dibbler. Mm, yes. Is this his first scene in all the books? I think it might be. Possibly. I, just, I don't remember him from any of the earlier ones. He's just so set in, like baked mm. into it for me. I just feel like he's been there the whole time. He's so. one of those characters that shows up surprisingly. Late. I mean, look, you know, we're in book eight of about 40, so it's not that late really, but it feels late for a character that you just so associate with the series. But yeah, he's doing his thing, selling fake dragon detectors. And I hate that every time he comes up in a book, I'm like, I do need hot dogs. Like I just, <laughs> <laughs> and like I don't do it because I I want to live for a while at least. And but every time, I, it takes me at least ten pages to sort of like try and tamp down that idea that I really want to eat some like a sausage in a bun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is the real horror of this story, I guess. <laughs> yeah, seems reasonable. Yeah, best we meet him because he's selling merch at the at the site. Is it? So yeah, and uh, and sausages. Yeah, because um, there's a gathering of people. Mm. Um, but the gathering is not very successful, as we say. The dragon slayers are all like, "Now nah, fifty thousand dollars, get stuff, mate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got better places to be." Uh, and the petition is at the same time having a meeting with all the heads of the guilds to try and you know convince them that he knows what he's doing or is indeed doing anything, <laughs> which which is not clear. What are you going to do about a dragon? I guess you send it off to look after the Von Trapp children and teach them to love each other through song and curtains. (laughs) Wait, no, sorry, I I may have veered off into a different text. It's not quite the right problem. (laughs) How do you solve a problem like, oh, right. Like a dragon. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. No, I like that. There's no solution though. Not, Not forthcoming anyway. I did like the parallel they draw because they're like, why is a dragon even in the city? Like, surely they live in the, you know, it must be magical. And the current arch-chancellor of the um, university says, no, 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 they've come into the city. They're like urban foxes. (laughs) (laughs) I I wish there were urban dragons. That would be great. We could have an adoption program. Maybe not grand dragons, though. No, no. Yeah. But certainly swamp dragons. Oh, I really came around to swamp dragons. As in, like, I didn't dislike them at all before this, but I really sort of came away going, oh, they're cute. I want one. Yeah. I'm like an Errol. Errol yeah. was, Errol's pretty cute. Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I, it was interesting because in my mind, you know, you, you posted the picture of the graphic novel adaption of this where you can see Vimes is holding the dragon, mm. like, you know, like a rifle cocked over one arm. <laughs> um, and that's not Errol because Errol mm. is not the one you can use as a gun. No. <laughs> it's not, it would not be helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd forgotten that that wasn't Errol. Mm. I was like, but it's so cute. And you almost never see Vimes with a dragon later on. Like he visits them in the grounds of yeah. the Ramkin estate, but he doesn't 
have a pet one or carry it around because the pet one he has <laughs> runs off. Yeah. As we will get to at the end of the novel. He gets a butler instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's trading up really, I suppose. <laughs> or down, depending on how rare the two are. Mm. I feel like it's implied that he, while he might not have ace, there are on occasion a few specific dragons that are house dragons, but there's also like he um, clearly like helps look after them. They're always depicted as being excited to see him and Mm. knowing that they're going to get like, you know, a lump of coal and a rub behind the ears or something. Yeah. And even in Men at Arms, like he has no trouble picking one up and using it to light a cigar. (laughs) (laughs) Um, He's become much more comfortably badass by the second book that yeah. he appears in whereas in this one he's very like not quite fitting the mold by by men at arms you feel like he must have been doing this for a long time because he's almost like danny glover and lethal weapon he's like i'm too old for this shit you know uh whereas in this one he's just sort of like no i really am too old for this <laughs> like i'm out of shape and this is no good um but he really turns his life around mm. after this book i think which is which is interesting uh, but i really like that meeting with the patrician as well because there's that bit where the patrician is talking with once afterwards saying, are, they, are these dragons intelligent? Like he's trying to figure out what's an angle. How can I deal with this dragon? Um, and Wants says, oh, yeah, no, but they have silver tongues. And my favorite bit is the patrician says, only silver. <laughs> like, ah, <laughs> yes, you can see a flaw there. Also during that interview, because they talked to Vimes again about what are you doing about this dragon? He's like, so you told me to cover it up. It's like, do something about it. So Vimes has a few idle ideas and it's, it's really presented as though he's got these sort of policeman's instincts that he doesn't even realize that he has at this stage, or they've just gotten so rusty because he hasn't been using them since the decline of the watch that he's forgotten them. And he, you know, he says, if it even did come from somewhere or, you know, if it does have a lair and once is like, what do you mean by that? (laughs) And (laughs) that's like the first big hint as to who the grandmaster is, I feel. Yeah, and because Vimes has noticed that there's footsteps leading towards the freeze but not away from... Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, like how did it come out of an alley it didn't go into? Yeah. But no one else is thinking this in town. All they know is about dragons is that they have a giant pile of gold and they like to chain virgins to a rock. And mm. since Ankh-Morpork is built on loam, they're not too worried about the rock part of things. <laughs> yes. So they're now all out hunting for this gold, his lair. Not because they want to, like, quash the dragon, but because they want a bit of the... Bit of the money. I want some of that gold. Mm. Sweet hoard. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and it's around that time that the dragon comes back for the fourth time. And this time it destroys the watch house, mm. which is the other big hint that, hang on, Vimes just said something that sort of gave away. He knew something about what's going on. And now the dragon is incinerating the watch house. Who else could have known about this? Mm. We're getting too close. Um, and it's always that thing, you know, once you start to find out who the villain is, the villain tips their hand a little bit. Um, but all the, everybody survives the destruction of the watch house. All four um, of them. Yeah, all four of them. They watch the dragon fly away and they're like, That's a, that it can't do that. Like, again, they're really impressed with how impossible it seems to be. I, I just enjoyed how much every time... You know, the the sensible people in the book saw it. They weren't just going, wow, a dragon or, oh, my God, a dragon, we're going to die. But, like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's wrong, but it's working kind of like a 14-month-old toddler walking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, it just, just doesn't look right, but it's happening. Well, that long-standing myth about bumblebees. That they, what is the myth about bumblebees? Well, people used to say that according to the laws of aerodynamics, it should be impossible for a bumblebee to fly, which is not actually true. It was based on a flawed understanding of how they fly. You know, it was for a long time, it was a myth, but they clearly do fly. So obviously, obviously everything's fine. Mm-hmm. But you look at like proper English bumblebees when you see pictures of them uh, and you're just like, they do look a bit ridiculous. <laughs> it's just like this so ball of fuzz. So big and fuzzy, mm. such tiny little wings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very cute, though. They are. Yeah. yeah. But if you see them in Australia, listeners, um, please report them to the relevant authorities. They're not supposed to be here. <laughs> um, they're, they're terrible. For... They're not supposed to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they're supposed to be at home. So they should buzz off back. <laughs> yes. To... <laughs> it's two podcasts in a row we're talking about bees. Yeah, it's just our hive mind. <laughs> I'd like to apologise for all of our uh, apiarist <laughs> listeners um, who have heard all these bee puns before. I'm sure. All right. Um, it's a it's a, a bee peat. Um, now, but not our ape purists because <laughs> they're here for the librarian content. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and good on them. We welcome you with open arms. Really long arms. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, so they they survive the explosion of the watch house. Or not, well, not explosion. They melt to, into slag of the mm. old watch house. And Vimes wakes up 
in Sybil's boudoir, <laughs> as Nobby puts it. Um, and this is like, there's some stuff happens in this scene that I'm like, wow, like the, the Sybil Ramkin does not have any boundaries. <laughs> like she's rubbing ointment on him. She gives him a slap on the ass at one point. <laughs> like you've only just met, but you can imagine it being like a gym teacher sort of like, yeah. you know, sort of jolly hockey sticks kind of off you go, get back on the field, slap, like kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Except that he's in her bed yeah. and she clearly fancies him. So it's all a little bit. Ooh. I do feel like she's treating him like a sick dragon. Though. Yeah. Very much so. Well, she, she clearly doesn't have much interaction with other people. Yeah. <laughs> Not unless the other people are also dragon mm. fanciers. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was kind of cute, but kind of weird. Weird cute. It was a, it was a, a meat weird. <laughs> is that a thing? <laughs> or a weird meat? A or weird. is that, um, that's, that's Dibbler's food? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like more like witches getting together. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> side point. I really did enjoy Magrat getting a brief mention early on in the book because they mentioned that they got the witch garlic to... Yes. yes. Yeah, oh. which means that Carrot's home mine is in the Ram Tops. Mm. And not just in the Ram Tops, but in Magrat's home turf mm. in Lanka. And there's a few little little hints of other stuff, like a little bit of continuity here and there, mm. uh, which is, again, I think why I found it so weird that Vimes' character is so... Or whose attitude towards royalty in particular and his history seems so retconned as of the next book when there's so many other little continuity things that remain consistent. Um, well, yeah. maybe in between Guards, Guards and Men at Arms, he got an Ancestry.com mm. subscription. <laughs> he sent his DNA <laughs> off to a wizard. Yeah, on the clacks. <laughs> and that- yeah, he sent it off, and that's how he found out that um, Stoneface Vimes killed the king. Yeah, because he doesn't uh, know anything. Very about much that. like the Golden State Killer here. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, could be the case. Yeah. Um, the on the topic of um, excellent little cameos here, this is also, I think, where we meet Detritus. Yes, because oh, he's yeah. in this book, and I don't think he's in anything previously. It's a, a squelcher or something. Like yeah, uh, the bouncer that's more efficient. He's a yeah, yeah. That, at um, the, the drum. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so when they have the big fight in the drum, he's the yeah, he's the bouncer, and he gets he gets punched out by Carrot. I'm <laughs> like, look, I know you said he was six foot six and nearly as broad, but he's not magically straight. He's not He Man. Like, how does he punch <laughs> out a troll? Maybe he flung someone else at him, and it was just he was he's lucky he got him in the vulnerables. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the that's probably the explanation. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was yeah. Yeah, I think I think Detroit does show up in between this and Men at Arms. I think he might be in moving pictures or something, but it's, it's again a fairly small role. Um, and I did make a special note because they describe when he gets into town like the detritus of something, meaning it in the proper sense of the word. And hmm. I was like, oh, that must mean that detritus is not not in this book or not thought of yet because you're using his name as a as a describing word to be real year three about how to just say things. Yeah, but um. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay but then he is and i was like oh okay that's yeah that's good i was sad we didn't see more of him but we, we get to see heaps of him in men at arms so. there's a yeah. lobsang um brief cameo it, as well there's a lobsang mentions yeah. i saw that right at the end and he's like is it the same one it must be yeah, yeah. it has to be and we haven't met him in the books at this stage so he might have just been a throwaway name and then project came back and went i'm gonna use that mm. yeah yeah, so um, while he's recovering in the boudoir suddenly the angry horde comes because they've heard that she's got dragons and there's a bad dragon on the loose, so we should probably kill all these ones too. Oh, and Vimes gets his dirty Harry moment. Mm. The dragon. Oh, so good. But this And this is really where that kicks off in the book because from this point on, in most of the action scenes, there's lots of parodies of, you know, famous police and action film stuff. And Casablanca for some reason. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, why not? Why not, really? Because it's guess. terrible. <laughs> okay, fair. Wait, it's, it's terrible? We'll come back to that. Okay. Another day. Okay, all right. We'll come back to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, and for the rest of our lives. Um, mm. So, yeah, and that's... I, I enjoy... I love that scene. Mm. Uh, and I think that's where, if there was any question about Sybil sort of going, what a man. <laughs> like, this is when <laughs> it happens, if nowhere, if not before. Because he's, yeah, he sort of shows up. He hears a mob and he gets out of bed and brings a dragon. And he's absorbed all the dragon knowledge. Because he knows he gets the dragon's name right, and he like says all this stuff about his like how, how hot his flame is going to be, and all this thing. Like, you were really listening to Lady yeah. Sybil, and he read her book about the diseases that she wrote. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Except he's too squeamish to look at the illustrations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, he... they involve a lot of red. Mm. 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 Yeah, so he he sort of makes the mob back off wearing his nightgown and fluffy slippers, 
and they're all about to leave when Sybil sort of jumps in and goes, not quite yet. You all got to <laughs> chip in for the dragon sanctuary. Yes. <laughs> And I, I start to suspect there's more than one Sunshine Sanctuary mm. because it, when it's initially mentioned in the book, it's the Sunshine Sanctuary for Lost Dragons. And then at this point in the book, it's the Sunshine Sanctuary for Sick Dragons. And I think at one point there's, maybe not in this book, it might be Men at Arms, there's a Sunshine Sanctuary for Wayward Dragons, <laughs> which is where I need to send my dragon. He's very naughty. But yes. um, Is there a Sunshine Sanctuary for dragons who can't read good and want to learn to do other stuff good too? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope there is. What is this? A, a centre for dragons? <laughs> yes. That's why it's this size. Oh, uh, yeah, they yeah. are smaller than yes. people. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no, I, oh, it was great. It was really great. Um, and that's also where Vimes discovers that he quite likes the dragons mm. because he feels like they're the downtrodden of the animal world and they're mm. sort of fated to be on the bottom of the heap and he feels quite kinship with them really. Um, which I thought was just delightful. I was like, and didn't we all feel the same? Didn't we all love those dragons mm. just as much? Oh, so cute. And now that dragons have been cute, the terrifying one comes back into play, but fortunately there's a big hero in town with a big shiny sword ready to take him out. Well, thank goodness. Yeah. yeah he must what be, a coincidence. Must be some kind of king. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. 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 I, and this play, like, he, and we never, we never actually meet him no. in the book. Which is a big clue that he's not important, I suppose. But they, they mention who he is and he's waiting outside town. And we see him from a distance when he's preparing to confront the dragon. We never see him actually confront the dragon in the book. It's skipped over. And it's like, it was now two o'clock the next morning. <laughs> and everyone's celebrating. And you're like, oh, really? Okay. All, yep. all right. But not to get too literature about it, it's kind of a really good technique to show that he is a hollow puppet. You don't even need to get to know anything about what he does, why he does it. Who, like what his name is because it's irrelevant, even if he was king for the next 100 years because he's just a hollow puppet man with a shiny sword. But yeah, everyone gets on board. They're suddenly like, okay, well, he got rid of the dragon and there's no dragon bits around, but that's probably, we don't know how dragons die. That's fine. Let's all celebrate, um, put the patrician into the dungeons and we've got a king now. Good. Swift. Yeah, and we're kind of almost ready for a coronation that we, in theory, didn't know that we were going to be having, you know, 12 hours ago. Yeah, hmm. very, very suspicious. Who's um, going to walk him down the aisle? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At the same time as that dragon comes back, though, for the fifth thing, uh, before it arrives, Vimes has his big idea, which is that, hey, do you think one of these little dragons could sniff out the big one? Which it kind of can. And he ends up adopting Errol. Mm-hmm. The, who's not called Errol at that point. He's still got his official name. Good so, boy, yeah. Bindle Featherstone. What a great name. Mm. I had a dog uh, once, like a purebred miniature Labradoodle, and he had an official breeding name that was exactly like that. And yeah. I didn't know that that was actually a real thing. So reading this book, I'm like, oh, that's right. This is actually how it works with, like, you know, horse, you know, stallions and, you know, purebred horses and purebred dogs and oh, weird. Best in show, like... Yeah, weird business. Now I want to see. Oh, now I want to see the best in show, but with swamp dragons. <laughs> how great yes, would that be? That would be amazing. Oh. and it would be quite accurate to how the real thing is. Because remember that time that Danny the Pekingese won Crufts, and they had to put him on an ice pack when they announced his award in case he got too excited and overheated and died. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> As if he knows that he's won an award. But how like all the know? attention and the lights oh, and yeah, the okay. yeah, yeah, and gets a bit excited and then. But yeah, if he. Overheats, oh, so it's on an ice pack. I mean, look, you know, that's. I, I think the thing about the swamp dragons is, I think it, it does kind of highlight how horrible that the, all these breeds that have like defects that are sort of bred into them because we want them to look a particular way and be, be able to behave a certain way, but then also like they can't breathe properly or they have back problems or leg problems. Or... Have you seen pictures of pugs from 150 years ago? They look very different. Really? Yeah. So different. Yeah. Like worse or better? Pro- they look like proper dogs. I'm sorry. Dogs pugs. can actually breathe. Like wow. pugs are cute, but like they, they've been bred to look weird. Yeah. And they yeah. used to look like normal dogs. And I I would encourage any listeners who would like to get a dog to, you know, adopt a rescue dog, which I I know if I ever get another dog, that's what I would do. I have a shelter cat and he's very good. (laughs) Says Liz, staring at the massive scratch on the back of her hand. I was going to ask if you got that from a dragon. (laughs) You know what you did. Um, Well, that's that's unusual because normally you don't know what you did when a cat scratches you. (laughs) I was talking on the phone and not patting him. So, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Uh, Asimov, you're a bad cat. I can say that because I've never met him in person. <laughs> He's actually a very nice cat. So um, 
tune in for my podcast that's all about my cat for three hours, but no. <laughs> <laughs> we can make that happen. It's called my Top Twitter. Of the <laughs> it, is, it is a Twitter. Uh, well, just, you know, watch out for more Pratt Cats yep. uh, <laughs> in our <laughs> Instagram stream. They go looking for the dragon. Errol tries to sniff out the dragon. He sniffs up to where the dragon was last time it was summoned and then trots off. Uh, and they think, well, this is a failure, and then it arrives. Um, but that's also when they find out there's a hero here to kill the dragon, and he's waiting in the square, and the dragon shows up, and there's a crowd assembled to see what happens. And suddenly everyone's a monarchist. Yeah, because he does defeat the dragon. Well, the dragon disappears. So yeah. like, and so, so I guess it's done. Therefore. I guess so. Yep. Makes sense, I guess. Which is exactly what happens in the Harry Potter movies but not the books that harry somehow vanquishes voldemort and goes inside is like oh no i killed that guy and everyone's like yeah we believe you yeah of course yeah. like where's the body oh there's there's no body. Oh, he turned into flakes it's fine yeah yeah <laughs> yes he's just like... a pile of dandruff now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's great i mean isn't that what you wanted well done 17 year old boy on killing the person who's been terrorizing wizards for the last like yeah. 20 years yeah thank thank you teenager for killing wizard hitler yeah <laughs> uh well actually speaking of um speaking of uh, Harry Potter. I thought you were going to say speaking of Wizard Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of Wizard Hitler. Uh, no, but speaking of Harry Potter, um, when the the hero, the wannabe king, blows a horn, Colin's like, hmm, that's a slug horn. <laughs> I was like, what, is that a real thing? Yeah. And apparently it's a real thing. Yeah. I did not know that. And there's a very good joke that must have been a big slug. The king's reign is actually surprisingly short considering how much time and effort has gone into placing him there and manoeuvring him there mm. because mm. the dragon that's now been banished back unfortunately has gotten some sort of glimpse into the world or some free will and so it's not satisfied to simply go back into its box. No. So, yeah. Into no. its sardine tin. Mm. It's, wants, which I make picture as that like Escher picture. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, like yeah. With, the, with the other sort of head to tail, mm. and there's, there's this blank space between two dragons is but actually it's... another dragon. Yeah, yeah, that's it's oh yeah, it's such a good mental image, and it's hard to picture it working in three dimensions. But I'm like, oh, that's still really cool. But like, what dimension is imagination in? Oh yeah, good point. I don't know. Um, and I mean, uh, this is I gotta say when when the king takes over and they're talking about him, um, Sybil talks about how she dislikes kings. But Vimes has, like, no knowledge of kings whatsoever in mm. this book. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, but it's really quite, like, because someone says, he says he's an heir. And Vimes is like, what do you mean? He goes, like, an heir to the throne. He goes, what throne? He goes, an heir to the throne of Ankh. And he's like, what throne of Ankh? And you're like, you know this stuff. Like, mm. This is history. This is important to you. And yet in this book, no, nah, he's got no clues. He's got a sort of, in fact, there's even a line later on where he says, like, I don't have any, he doesn't have anything against kings per se. And you're like, whoa, what? Hold on. What about your DNA? Your what king murdering DNA? is this? Yeah. Um, really, really kind of jarring. But apart from that, yeah. it's fine. It's fine. We'll forgive that. That's okay. There's some time travel that happens. Maybe we'll blame that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, it probably screws things up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's okay. Um, but that's this is also where his like ancient policeman senses are mentioned uh, that are sort of waking up within him, um, and uh, and a whole bunch of stuff happens as the dragon reappears. This is it's like a little section of the book where a whole bunch of plot threads sort of um, coalesce before the dragon comes back. Like quickly, the the librarian goes into L space um, with string. He, he takes some string with him, and he um, it's the first time L space is mentioned, and he travels through the library. The, he and it, it mentions that you know he's one of the librarians of space and time. And Amy, I, I know you're probably not allowed to tell us, but I have to ask: Are you one of the librarians of space and time? Um, just blink twice so that only we know and yep. the listeners. Well, might. I can probably talk about it. It's not like we're being recorded or anything. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. No. Once you um once you finish your library and information management qualification, and after the first time you've um unblocked a public toilet, um. <laughs> then, yeah, you get initiated. Hmm? Wow. Are you allowed to go back in time? I mean, you're not allowed to meddle with causality. That's one of the three cardinal rules. We yeah, yeah. Book, we're, but... we're really not big on meddling with causality. Okay. But, um, yeah, you know, move back and forth and sideways as need be. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Actually, and on a side note, while he's going through L space and they, they explain that, you know, sometimes you end up in a place where you weren't intending to be in a completely different world and that's why some booksellers... Uh, seem a bit otherworldly or unearthly. Yeah. I was like, this is this came out like the year before Good Omens, in which Aziraphale the angel 
is posing as a bookseller. I'm yeah. like, it's all interconnected, guys. It's just a big web of Pratchettisms. ETs in Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's yeah. So, so weird. <laughs> so weird. Oh, the other weird thing that happens during that, I, I do want to mention, is that it's specifically mentioned that dragons eat anything except metal and igneous rock. And then every time they mention weird things that Errol is eating after he's gone looking for the dragon and seen it in person, he's eating something metal. Like he's... he eats the kettle, he eats the coal scuttle, he eats like he a whole does eat a fire poker polish. as well. Yeah, I think. yeah, he eats heaps of metal stuff. A doorknob <clears> at one point, and I'm like, nobody ever mentions this. <laughs> they just go, he just eats all this weird stuff. Um, but yeah, it's I, I thought that was interesting because it is very definitely a clue as to what's going on with him. Uh, but yeah, dragon comes back. And this time with free will and autonomy. Yeah, and not at the beck and call of someone else. Mm. It sort of reaches out. Uh, although as that's happening in the square, Vimes is right there, like investigating, and he's like doing a chalk outline of where mm. he thinks the dragon's body should have been, which was pretty great. I thought that was <laughs> such a good visual. I can just imagine if it was like adapted, you know, for film or TV, you can see above there's this big chalk outline of wings and stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if Sybil arrives in her coach to try and save him because they both have this feeling that something's going to happen at the same time. Again, like this sort of fate that they're both in tune with each other and they both understand what's going on. I thought that was really nice. Um, and he gets in the carriage and then the dragon appears and they almost get squashed. And then Sybil gets out of the carriage to tell it off. It's like, mm. no, we just need to be firm with it. <laughs> uh, and there's a whole bit with Vimes's legs refuse to be heroic because they don't want to get squashed. Um, yeah, I thought that was great. Mm. Was, I mean, and this is Sybil's sort of, it's not her only big moment, but I think it's like her biggest moment in the book. Mm. I loved it so much. And she almost like got away with it because she broke eye contact to get it a treat from her pocket that yeah. it didn't work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, and then she gets like pinned down by one claw, and that's when Vimes is like, "Oh shit, I've got to do something." Mm. Um, and that's um, that's kind of when Errol turns up, mm. like making a lot of noise and jumping up and down, but not really being able to do much. Like puffing himself up like a like a male pigeon, you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I just imagined that though, and I thought it was so cute, you know. He's like, because it, it doesn't feel like they're going to fight at that stage because clearly he's going to get squashed. And it's more like when a little puppy wants to play with a big adult dog and you're just like, it's not going to work out, mate. <laughs> like, he's going to bite your head off. Yeah. Uh, but it's so cute. And mm. I, I imagined it like that. But then, you know, with a big dragon that's going to eat everyone. Mm. Um, so it would be less cute. But yeah. yeah. Um, so the dragon reappears, flies off into the clouds, disappears for a while, but it's still there somewhere lurking. But no one will believe, Vimes, that it's come back, including Lupine Wants, who um, fires him, just takes his badge off him. Mm. Mm. Because this is at the coronation where this is all sort of going down, where he's sort of hobnobbing with the other people. Oh, yeah, because that's, that's why they take it off him. That's right, because he, he thinks he sees the dragon. But it's a raven. Yeah, but it's a raven. And it just made me think of Chief Brody in Jaws 2. I have to confess, I've only seen... The final scene of Jaws, out of all the Jaws movies, I've just seen the one where, like, it's just chomping on the boat. And I've seen it, like, ten times, not on purpose. Like, I just have this special ability of turning on the TV <laughs> when it's that moment of Jaws. Yeah. And so, like, every three years I turn on the TV and it's that scene. And I've never seen the rest of the film. I assume it's about a big, mean shark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Basically. <laughs> and in the second one, um, when there's some evidence that there's another shark... Um, and Brody, there's the police chief played by Roy Scheider. He sort of like gets up and he's like, there's a shark, get out of the water. And there is no shark. He's just um, sort of a bit on a hair trigger because he remembers the trauma of the previous time. Uh, and that's what that moment reminded me of when yeah. Vimes sees the raven. Vimes is just dragon. raving about dragons. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, at least brain-brained. he's not crowing about it. Oh. Uh, Oh, see, that, this well, is they're very I, good. I knew, I knew after a certain number of episodes, I'd start just joining in. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, contagious. It's just, yeah, birds of a feather. <laughs> anyway, so he he nicks off, um, sort of to live the rest of his life not in the in the watch. Yeah, but then suddenly, dragon is actually back, and everyone properly sees it. And yep, something bad happens to the brethren. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the first thing it does is toasts the uh, elucidated brethren's headquarters while they're all inside it. Well, Except, not quite all of them. Yeah, one of them's getting pizza. Yes, brother fingers is out getting pizza. Which I like the way they said. Uh, they always said brother fingers to get the pizza. It was cheaper that way. Yeah, but the grandmaster is not there. No, the grandmaster is yeah. also not there. Uh, but the 
the watch do catch brother fingers and they sort of take him back to sort of get over his shock and things Mm -hmm. he sort of ends up running out screaming when they talk about something and around that time is when the librarian emerges out of l space and where he's decided to go or rather when is one week ago in his own library so he can figure out what happened to the book uh, and he reads the book because it's still there at that point. Then he puts it back on the shelf and he waits for someone to come and take it and he follows them home and he figures out who they are. Well, I say figures out, he just sees who they are. <laughs> like, yeah. It feels a bit like cheating, really. Well, how he probably feels in that moment is how I feel when I return a hot pick to the library, wait for them to process it. I'm sorry, I know you're a librarian, Amy. <laughs> and then just reborrow it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did it by leaving my bookmark in it last time. <laughs> wow. That's that, that's ballsy. I like it. Yeah, so yeah. It's, I guess it's like that feeling times a hundred. <laughs> what the librarian has right now yeah. where he's traveled through time to access this book that he can't otherwise have. And uh, one thing that's actually I, I like too that happened during this whole sec- thing that also made me think of Jaws is that throughout the time when the dragon is lurking in the clouds, there's a really thick fog in Ankh Pork, which they refer to as an autumn gumbo. <laughs> it's like a pea super, but much thicker. Uh and I thought that was great because because then I just got this imagined of like you, know, you can just see it just like cl- wings in the clouds and coming yeah. down. But of course, once it comes down and incinerates the brethren, then its next move is to eat the king, mm. the, uh, the wannabe king, and become king itself. Uh, they give it the crown because they're like, what else do you do with a dragon that your king supposedly killed returns and eats your king? Well, d- d- I guess it's the king now. Well, because it grabs once and then you, and then all of a sudden once emerges unscathed and you're like, huh, that's weird, and then. Once is kind of like the spokesperson for the Dragon King and summons all the guild leaders to be like, this is what the... Eat these fattening foods. Anyway, um, this is what the Dragon wants. Um, it wants some tribute, which is voluntary. Um, wants to eat some women. Um, anyway, um, does anyone have any jewels to offer? That meeting, oh man, like, it reminded me... Have you ever seen Torchwood? The third season of Torchwood, which is called Children of Earth. There's sort of these aliens that return to Earth and they have this massive destructive power... And they demand that the people of Earth give them their children. There's this chilling scene. I think it's on the third or fourth episode because they demand like 10% of the Earth's children or something. And so the UK is like, okay, well, um, how do we pick which 10%? And they just talk about how they're going to make it happen. And it just reminded me of this scene where they're being told we're gonna, you're going to have to sacrifice someone, let, let the dragon eat someone every month. And it's going to be a ceremony and they've got this internal monologue where they're like, well, someone else will talk up about this and I will like sort of indicate that I don't agree while I'm not making it too obvious because I don't want to get eaten by a dragon. And then no one does and they all go, oh, what a bunch of cowards. And, like, mm. uh, and yeah. then they all leave and you're like, yeah, you are complicit in this. Like you are not, you're it's not like, as active, but you're just letting it happen. It's the evil you walk past is the evil you accept. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. Uh, But then you get the assassin and the merchant guild leaders who have a bit of a chat about it. And uh, the Assassin's Guild leader, who's not named in this, um, so it's never quite clear which one it is, whether it's Cruces or the previous one, but he, um, or another Cruces, let's not get into that yeah. again though. <laughs> uh, but one of those says, why do you think we're called privy councillors? And he says, mm. well, I think it's because you expected to just eat a lot of shit. <laughs> and you're like, that's such a good line. And, oh. and then after that, once in the dragon, who are shown to have a sort of telepathic communication where they can actually talk to one another, talk about whether it's worth doing this. Like, surely you don't need to eat people and it's kind of a oh it's what's always been done like they have a bit of a philosophical chat about it but it takes a bit of a turn that i didn't expect where the dragon who's very staunch about eating these people Mm. is also more moral in some ways because it's kind of like that scene in the fifth element where lilu who's supposed to be like the the perfect human being taps into what is essentially the internet and learns all of humankind's atrocities and Mm. is like is human race even worth saving because they're awful and so the dragon skims the top of Once's mind and kind of has this great line. It's like, you have the effrontery to be squeamish, it thought, to, thought at him, but we were dragons. We were supposed to be cruel, cunning, heartless, and terrible. But this much I can tell you, you ape. The great face pressed even closer so that Once was staring into the pitiless depths of his eyes. We never burned and tortured and ripped one another apart and called it morality. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, That's I really oh, I love that bit. It's so Pratchett as well. It's that idea, you know, his his humanity or his humanitarianism comes out by pointing out the ways in which we often don't show it as people. And the, and, and the, a big theme of this book is the way people will just accept whatever seems to be the path of least resistance, even if they know it's awful and evil. And there's that scene after that 
where Colin, of all people, is the one who's going, it's not right, you know, you shouldn't have, like, people who are better than other people. And Nobby's like, oh, is that right, Frederick? And he says, that's Sergeant Colin to you. <laughs> but then in the yeah. later scene, he really does mean it. And he's, a, he's, he's like, no, the, the people won't accept this. They'll rise up. They'll have a, you know, a rising mm. against the dragon. And he's talking to the crowd when he's forced to give this proclamation, telling everyone that the dragon is going to be eating someone every month. And there's, a, there's like, only one voice in the crowd that's like, no, we can't put up with this. And it's a man who's got like three daughters. He's like, I don't want any of my daughters eaten by a dragon. And when it comes to the crunch, um, almost he literally, <laughs> yeah. when the dragon flies out and has watched, turns out has been watching this gathering all along, uh, everybody else leaves that guy in the middle mm. and he gets incinerated by the dragon. And again, one, like once again, he has skin in the game. That's not sort of, let's look at the bigger picture for humanity. It's, mm. I literally would lose my three daughters potentially. So it's in my best interest to, to fight this. Which, I mean, you understand that, and he's still being brave, but it's not bravery for the sake of bravery. It's self-interest, like yeah. on the correct side. But it's, the whole thing is about drawing lines and putting yourself on a different side. And mm. you see the line move, and people move from one side to the other throughout the book. Like Colin, in particular, like he sort of his wife becomes a staunch monarchist, and he sort of becomes this sort of lame is rebel, yeah. not very effective. But no. it's just. It's interesting how that sort of divides. And a little bit yeah. like a union leader. He's got that great line where he says, the people united can never be ignited. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes. But I think um, that point you were making, Liz, is a really, really good one about, you know, choosing the right thing for the wrong reason. And I think it comes back as well to what we were discussing earlier around how the brethren's self-interest and petty-mindedness and the way that they're choosing to express that, um, you know, can be seen metaphorically in so many ways in the world at the moment and I think that the daughters thing is a great example because so many times when people are talking about Mm. you know violence against women of various sorts or whatever it's like oh well you know this is really important because you know what if it was your daughter Mm. or your wife or whatever and it's like well we're not just daughters and wives and girlfriends we're we're people yeah it's not ownership and it's not how you're connected to someone else yeah and so you know someone saying oh well you know i really i think rape culture is a bad thing i really really want to work against um you know misogynistic attitudes towards women because like i've got a baby daughter now well you're wanting to do the right thing but that's the wrong reason like Mm. you should have started long before this kind of really quite self-interested reason yeah Mm. absolutely yeah and again it's like it's yeah it's it's that humanitarianism that we lack as human beings until mm. there's that personal connection which we hope we people can rise above it's but, like can you pay everyone to be moral like yeah. or to act with morals but not be anyway it's just that's getting too deep into it oh, it's, it's too real <laughs> um but it is but it is real and that's what makes you know and that's that's one of the things that makes pratchett's books so wonderful is that even though they are about fantastical things like dragons and uh, magic and and you know people who've been turned into orangutans there's still that essential reality of how people act and when the books are about people and when they're grounded in a place like Ankh-Morpork Pork or like Lanka, they they do deal with very real themes that affect us in the real world. And I think that's that's one of the reasons for his great success, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what happens after that is the librarian comes back out of L-Space <clears throat> from t- a week ago <clears throat> knowing who the person is <clears throat> and he is pissed off. He is not happy. Has he been, he's been made an officer of the watch as well, but by yes. this point we didn't talk about that, but oh, he's been yeah. sworn in. That's right, and he's taking it very seriously. Mm. So when he gets his string to lead him his way through L-Space, he also bites off a bit to tie the badge around his neck so that he feels official. But this is also when the other watch members, who are, there's a great moment where they're referred to as the rank and file, and then it's like, well, the rank. Yeah. And then for the rest <laughs> of the book, they're referred to as the rank, which I thought was hilarious. They're up on top of a roof watching out for the dragon and... Carrot mentions that his granddad told him, his dwarf granddad presumably, told him about the dragons and that they always have a vulnerable spot. Yes. But, you know, it's like a million to one chance that you can hit it. And they start to get obsessed with making sure it's a million to one chance. And I love that bit so much where they're like, okay, I'm going to stand on one leg and I'm going to put soot on my face and I'm going to be singing um, the, the wizard the staff has a novel. Oh, he's going to sing the hedgehog song. That's right. <laughs> and then he's like, and I'm, I'm facing the wrong way and I'm using my left hand. Is it a million to one chance now? And they're like, yep. I'd say so, because they're like, you know, a 999,746 to one chance. No one ever says that. (laughs) So, yeah, I love that. Oh, such a great concept. But meanwhile, Vimes 
has figured out by himself that it was once. And he goes to confront him. And it's interesting that he, he gives the reasons that he figured it out is the run and maybe the same sort of tone of voice. Whereas I'm like, well, there are other like better bits of evidence or better clues than that. But those are the ones that he chose to focus on. Once he figured it out, it all just sort of fell into place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Um, and once is the person who says, he says the name of the book. Mm, wins, yes. I, there used to be this thing in... Um, I that's, did... that's the main reason we don't like him, because he uses too many exclamation points. Mm. Yeah. Although he only and uses he has got one a diseased pill. mind. He yeah. does have a diseased mind. He's got mind. a dragon in it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I hope it's not contagious. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, once calls for the guards. And the guards who arrive are very genre-aware guards, because Vibes is confronting him, he's alone, he's unarmed, he's angry, and the guards are like... You sure you want us to arrest him? Like uh, this is usually when we get uh, completely the crap beat out of us. Yeah, he's going to swing off a chandelier. I mean, he's yeah. going to like use a poker from the fireplace. He's like, "What are you talking about? There is no fireplace. There's no chandelier. <laughs> Just get on with it." Uh, so they do it, um, and then they send. He sends some other guards to the Ramkin estate because mm. it's time for someone to get fed to the dragon. And who is? The most highborn maiden in all of Ankh-Morpork, Sybil Ramkin. But she thinks when she sees the silhouette of a guard at the window, because she's just been down to check on the dragons, that it's Vimes who's come back because they've previously had a bit of a, a bit of a tense moment, really, where after she rescues him from the dragon and he gives her Errol back because he's like, I can't really look after him. He keeps like, you know, dribbling on things and melting the floor. Then he goes, oh, I guess I'll be off. And there's that bit where they sort of both talk at the same time. And it's like, is something going to happen? Don't look back. And yeah. then she closes the door. And yeah, and he yeah. feels like really pissed off because he's like, I didn't even get all the way out of the driveway. And she closed the door. But he's like determined not to look back. And he's like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> and she's been crying. But then she's like, I'm not going to wallow too much. That's, that's nonsense. And I'm just, I've got things to do. Mm. And then she hears a knock at the door. And this is where Chekhov's lack of plume comes in yes. from earlier. Because there's a guard sort of silhouette with a plumed hat and as Pratchett's been doing throughout that whole book he's been talking about how much Vimes hates plumes he doesn't even take the two dollar plume allowance that he's allowed (laughs) that's yeah that's how much he hates them so (laughs) we know it's something else Mm. but she's sort of dolling herself up she's putting on her wig a little bit crooked she's sort of assessing her her um, appearance she's putting on some sort of horrifying perfume yeah yeah because she's like i've heard that men like this it's nonsense of course and you're like yeah yeah and then she opens the door and this is my favorite line that she has she said why captain she said winsomely this is a who the hell are you (laughs) she's already to chow the pants off him and like it's the wrong person and yeah they've come to take her and they threaten the dragons this is guys are jerks and but you can tell they've been told to do this they're not really like they're not they're not actively resisting doing what they're told mm. but they're also a bit uncertain about it because they're like we were told to take steps and by take steps they mean go and stab some dragons until she complies and she says well you let me get a jacket on closes the door and then moments later bursts through the door with a bloody great sword <laughs> in her hands I'm like yes and then gets tripped over because ancestor you know, statues yeah yeah she's she's used all of her uh you know um, sensibleness and uh, Ramkin resilience to learn about and train and look after dragons and not learn how to fight with a broadsword. So unfortunately, they deal with her fairly easily. And I thought it was interesting when they threaten the dragons, they take her away and then one of them's like, I thought we were supposed to just definitely kill the other dragon. Should we do that now? And the other guy goes, no, it was just supposed to be a threat. And anyway, like, do you think that the king would want us to kill? They're probably distant relatives. And then the mm. other one goes, oh, well, like people do that. And he's like, oh, this is different. Yeah, it's because we're civilised. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. That's again. Yeah. Uh, but Vimes gets thrown into a special cell in the palace and it turns out it's the cell where the patrician is. And I've forgotten <laughs> totally about this scene where he's like got all of the intelligent rats like working for him mm. because he's helped them overthrow the scorpions and the snakes. <laughs> and I was just like, this is so good. And then one of them's got a name. He's called Skirp. <laughs> yeah, Skirp and his people. Yeah. And I don't think we ever meet them again, which is a real shame. Maybe they come back in one of the books where the death of rats is mentioned. I don't know. Yeah. I certainly hope so. Yeah. yeah. But now I can imagine a whole, like just a whole story about Skirp and... Yeah. yeah, and I also really liked how um, they're bringing him things from the kitchens, and it says they rat handled it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's so good. And they can't read, so they they trying their best, but like they're supposed to bring a beer, and they bring brown sauce. Mm. And he wants books, and they bring him the best of lace making or a history of <laughs> lace making. He's like, well, I'm not one to turn down learning. Yeah, so. yeah. 
Oh, so good. Uh, and it seems quite comfortable in there because, as Vetinari says, never build a dungeon. You wouldn't be happy to spend one night in yourself. Uh, and I'm like, yep, okay, seems reasonable. And he points out, or he makes Vimes notice something himself. He's like, look at the door. It looks pretty solid, doesn't it? But it turns out that all that's on the other side is the lock. On the inside where all the bolts are. So it's kind of a fortress if he needs it. Yeah. And Vimes insists on breaking himself out, um, which he ends up doing with the help of the librarian who's who's decided that it's more important to help his captain now that he's in the watch uh, than it is to go after the book thief as much as that pains him to not punish a book thief. <laughs> look, uh, that's a big decision. <laughs> yeah, I, I can understand that. I mean, look, you know, I, I as as doing this podcast has made me realize how many Pratchett books I've lent to people over the years and not had returned and as I go through my collection and find the gaps I'm like oh I'm gonna track some people but I gave them those books I can't really blame them I should have been more vigilant I don't lend people books if I give someone a book I I don't expect to have it back so Mm. often I'll just buy another one and be like yes you can borrow this (laughs) <laughs> oh wow okay so no i fully just trusted people to give them back no uh, see people are bad is the, is the yeah, point of the book it, did, did you not understand what we've just been reading other than the book to a dragon <laughs> he does escape with the librarian's help he gets out after which the patrician's like oh, i guess he wanted to do that by himself it's probably for the best and he presses a secret stone where there's a stash revealed of all the things he could possibly need whilst in here including a key that unlocks the door <laughs> so he just leaves uh and meanwhile, something weird is going on with Errol, which we saw hints of when mm. Sybil was in looking at the dragons before she was taken away. But we only get a brief scene of that before we see Sybil being chained to what is maybe a rock, but is revealed not to be a rock because, mm. you know, we remember that Ankh Pork's on loam. There's no yep. rocks here. It's a bit of masonry and getting ready to be eaten by the dragon who is flying across the city ready for this feast. And the million to one chance is it's about to happen. Well, it sort of happens, isn't it? Because they, they fire the arrow. Yeah. Does not work. Uh, the dragon, though, notices, is annoyed, turns around and tries to incinerate them, uh, not realizing that they are standing on top of a Pond. whiskey distillery. Yeah. Mm. And it explodes and distracts the dragon, uh, which still helps because it gives Vimes just enough time to get to Sybil and free her before the dragon arrives. And the real one million to one chance is that they survive the explosion, <laughs> which I thought was a really nice mm. touch. Um and but it's too late um, because the dragon turns up and uh, it looks like it's dire. Uh, the rank are running to join them. Sybil and Vimes are standing at the rock. The dragon is facing them off. They're all going to die. No one's helping because they're like, yeah, everyone's yeah. like, oh, this is a spectacle, hooray! Mm. But then Errol turns up, mm. and Errol has rearranged his innards as we have been told earlier in the book. Swamp dragons can do so; they no longer flames out of his nostrils or his mouth. Instead. He flames out the other end and he's turned himself into quite an effective jet engine uh, and is flying around. And I just, it's such a good image. Mm. I remember, I think when I re- when I first read this, I remember thinking this was a hilarious fart joke because like, I was a teenager. And, I'm like, yeah. and now I just think that's cool. Like a dragon with big jet intake nostrils. And they are in fact described as if being big enough to look like jet intakes early in the book. Now he's like, yeah, flying it like, and he has a bit of a tussle with the dragon, but it's clear that he's not going to be able to f- like beat the big dragon in a fight. And he, he seems to run away. It'd be like a million to one chance if he, if he could beat this dragon. Yeah. And it was but like, it oh, just might work. Yeah. Uh, but he seems to run away and everyone's a bit disappointed, but Vimes is like, look, you know, he had a go. Don't, don't be mean to him. He's doing the only sensible thing to survive. So Sybil, who knows about dragons, like, usually they fight to the death. It's weird that he ran away. And so there's a noise because he's not run away. He's just getting a run up <laughs> and he breaks the sound barrier. There's like a big <laughs> sonic boom and he knocks down a whole bunch of buildings and the dragon sort of falls down to the ground unhurt. And everyone's like, oh, God, that's it. Like, there's no way. There's no way. It ends up trapped under the, the rubble. And you can imagine it's that usual sort of thing of like when a plane crash happens in a film, there's a big furrow in the ground Mm. and then there's a big collapse of stuff over it at the end. And Carrot uses his initiative, (laughs) as he so often does, and arrests the dragon (laughs) just as the angry mob start heading towards it to try and, you know... Orient express it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Never heard that as a verb before, but that's so perfect. Uh, And the rest of them try to catch up and make sure that Carrot doesn't die protecting the dragon from the mob. Because um, Vimes is sort of happy for the mob to kill it initially, but then Sybil's like, no, it's, it's not right. We shouldn't kill this dragon. It's just doing what dragons do. It's their nature. Mm. So, uh, But, you know, it doesn't 
it, it doesn't it doesn't quite work out that way as as neatly as as you would hope. Uh, but they do manage to fight the mob off. And I say fight the mob off. At one point, Sybil stands up and just says, "Who threw that?" <laughs> <laughs> it's very schoolmasterish. I quite enjoyed that. And then starts talking about this. The dashing Captain Vimes and his gallant men, and <laughs> Vimes is like going red as a beetroot. And he's just like, oh, he really does. He like he wouldn't be embarrassed if he didn't like her. You know, mm. he just think it was dumb. But he's like, oh no, that's, you're embarrassing me in front of the men. Um, and uh, they distract everyone long enough that the dragon's able to dislodge itself from the rubble. And just as they think, oh no, we're all going to die again, the dragon sort of lowers its eyes and kind of meekly submits to Errol. And they fly off together. Because they're in love. Yeah. Because <laughs> what does Sybil tell us that we hadn't figured out until now? She's a girl dragon. Yeah. It's, even really, it's the, like Shrek. Yeah. Even yeah. though they specifically call the dragon a he in the conversation between Wants and the dragon. Mm. So. Mm. Well, that's, you know, but I think, you know, that's that's Wants' expectation there because it's, it's been crowned king. So I think that's, you know. That's true. They mentioned sort of with the dragons that they don't seem to really bother about gender too much until it's breeding time anyway. Mm. But like also that they're all such idiots at everything to do with breeding. <laughs> like <laughs> like the, the females can't pick a good nesting site to save themselves and the yeah. males will like step on eggs without really even noticing. Yeah. And, and you're like, oh, you, how are you even still alive? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Um, Sybil, yeah, yeah. So the dragons leave, and it's, everyone's like, "Hooray! No more dragons. We're saved." Uh, and that's left to do some mopping up. One of the things, obviously, you've got to mop up is the fact that once is still out there somewhere. So once more into the breach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, they head back to the palace and confront him. Um, but not before he sort of thinks he sees the patrician, but thinks he must be dreaming. And then the patrician like keeps showing up wherever he goes. And he's like, <laughs> how could you get here? I've just got up 16 flights of stairs. How'd you get here before me? And he's like, he is a trained assassin. Like, yeah. I don't think we know that about him yet. But I just assumed he was like, you know, assassins creeding his way up the walls or something. But then he says later, he doesn't seem to know that secret passages are a thing. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but there's a final confrontation. The patrician is talking to Wands and then Vimes and the others show up. And Vimes wants to arrest him. And the patrician is like, really? Do we really need to do this? And Vimes tells the patrician to shut up. Mm. And while this exchange is going on, um, Wands still has the sword he gave the king to use against the dragon. And he goes to stab the patrician with it. And Vimes gets in the way. And he's got Carrot's sword, which is consistently described as... Boring, not magical. Non-magical, old, it's Completely unimpressive... Sword. Yeah. yeah, and yet when he uses it to parry the blade, the the really fancy, expensive one, it cuts it in half, mm. and then part of the blade flies into the wall behind him. And once is a bit nonplussed, he's like, "Oh, I'm still going to get out of here." And he's still got the book, and he says to Carrot, "Throw the book at him, like we're going to arrest him." <laughs> and Carrot, still being a dwarf, takes that very literally and throws the book of laws of Ankh-Morpork at him, knocking him over the edge mm. to his death. And it's that sort of thing where it's not quite a Disney or Doctor Who villain death that we've seen in some of the other Discworld books where he's kind of tricked into killing himself or, or doing something that causes his own demise, but where it's not really a deliberate, we're going to murder the bad guy. Yeah. It's just Carrot misinterpreting things and doing something dangerous. Yeah. And then, then we get to the sort of the aftermath hmm. where there's a few important things that happen. I mean, for starters, the librarian reclaims uh, the Summoning of Dragons book and also is given the law of Ankh Morpork by Vimes because he says that, that book's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and the patrician says there'll have to be a reward, like these things are important. So they go in asking for quite a lot of things. They've got quite a lot of nerve what they go in asking the yeah. patrician for. Like, what is it, five more dollars a month and a dartboard? Well, they want to and raise. A kettle. Yeah, because Errol ate their kettle. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's so kind of amused and upset by this. And Vimes just starts laughing and everyone gets annoyed and leaves. And Colin's like, oh, see, I told you we were pushing our luck with the dartboard. Oh. <laughs> and it's just so, it's so cute, you know. Yeah. And and then there's the the way that he talks about how his wife is treating him much nicer now. He brings home $10 more a month, which is a lot. Like, it's a lot of money because yeah. they were only yeah. on like $30 a yeah. month before. Yeah, 25% increase. That's huge. Yeah, I like how he was like, oh, she's real mad at me for not being a monarchist. She only made me beef dripping sandwiches. And then like Carrot and Nobby who were back, she was like, beef dripping. Oh, my God. And they sort of like go into raptures. And did it have any of the crunchy bits? And <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, no, feel sorry for me. It's bad. Yeah, yeah. it used to get better than this. That was delightful. And then, you know, one of the last things that happens in the book is there's the dinner. Mm. Vimes is invited to dinner at the Ramkin estate. 
and uh, they sit down at a, a table that's described really. Oh, he meets a few of the other dragon Fancy ladies. ladies. Um, yeah, when I, say, when I say dragon lady, and it seems like quite a reasonable thing, and then I realise that's a phrase that's used for other purposes. <laughs> um, but they're like, you know, the the dragon fanciers, including one who's the Dowager Duchess of Quirm. Yep. But who who speaks like an upper class English lady, whereas I always thought of Quirm as the France of the Discworld. But she could have married in. I guess so, mm. because that's true. Well, they they might have. It's probably all a bit of a blended thing now, because they're all in the same place, really. Mm. And but, I mean, surely um, her and Sybil have been friends since the Quirm College for Young Ladies, anyway. Oh, so and you learn true. an accent there. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, you learn the upper class lady accent mm. yeah. because you're you're good girls. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put that dragon down, girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. Um, uh, but then they have dinner, and I imagine the scene. It's like the it's like um, the table in the first Batman film where they're sitting. At, he and Vicky Vale are having dinner, and they're opposite ends of this stupidly long table and he says pass the salts and she's like what <laughs> they can't hear each other and it seems like it's gonna be like that and he sort of remembers eating and then they're talking and then there's a dragon under the table but of a different kind Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> my favorite line of this whole bit is that he starts talking about the dragons as a sort of a distraction from all the things that she's saying about how it's time she took an interest and clearly she's working herself up to something mm. and he talks about you know they've gone off together um, and, but clearly the big dragon needs magic. What happens when the magic goes away? And Sybil says, most people seem to manage. And I was like, oh, mm. I know. That's so cute. Feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but it does feel, I felt a bit like it was written a little bit like Vime sort of gives in rather than falls in love. But I guess what he's giving into is I should have just admit that I'm attracted to this woman because mm. she's she's lovely. She's got a heart as big as a city mm. and um, and she's kind of beautiful in her own way, you mm. know, and he can see that now because he's not mm. sort of starstruck by her nobility and the difference in rank and everything. And also that, you know, kindness makes a person more beautiful and she's got kindness in spades. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, shovels even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I actually think this thing with him kind of, yeah, admitting to himself that he does, um, well, fancy, if not actually love, just at the moment, Sybil, is actually a really important thing about Vimes and his development and the kind of character arc and that kind of sense of redemption kind of narrative that you end up getting across the City Watch books and Mm. where I think... Um, this sort of comes in is that line about Sybil at the end having you know a heart as big as the world there's a really neat parallel to that earlier in the book where obviously there's been all those um, that repeated motif of Vimes being brung low by a woman but there's a scene where he's drunk where he's in a monologue is talking about you know the city is a woman and mm. you know she's a bitch and all of that sort of thing so the city is what he has put his heart into and that's what's broken it and led him to sort of be where he is and obviously there may also be a human woman somewhere but we never mm. find that out but who is going to be someone who can help someone move towards their own sense of redemption in that kind of instance, except for someone who does have a heart as big as the world. Yeah. And and they directly inverts that line saying that the woman is a city, mm-hmm. you know, and he, and he can, he can be in that city. Yeah. You know? Um, in a in a lovely kind of emotional way. That's not. Yeah. I'm not trying to make any connotations. No, <laughs> no. It's about letting down his walls as well, which also ties yeah. very nicely into that metaphor. Yeah, and it teaches him that you know emotional vulnerability is actually <laughs> you know a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we get to the kind of the last scene of the book, which is the rank relaxing in the mended drum, and them sort of talking about, yeah, there couldn't have been a real king anyway. There's no kings left. It's like, how do you even know you've got a king? Like, it's just birthmarks and swords and carrots. Like, yeah, I've got a birthmark. It looks like a crown and I've got this sword. <laughs> and, and they look at it and this is where they sort of describe the sword as saying, like, it is crappy and it's kind of notched and it's old, but it's one thing it is, is always incredibly sharp, which is what they lead with in the descriptions of it in Men at Arms. So I was always kind of a bit surprised in this book that it wasn't there until it suddenly became important. And I was like, is this the same sword? And then I was like, oh, it is the mm. same sword. And Colin, of all people, is like, hmm. Because the patrician has already realised this, having looked at Carrot's sword and looked at Carrot up and down and said, I hope you have a long career in the watch. And now Colin's like, maybe there's some... Um, hmm. He's always good at telling us what to do. <laughs> um, and then that, the last, the very last bit of the book is uh, we find out that not only have Errol and the big dragon left Ankh-Morpork, Pork, they actually leave the Discworld entirely. They fly right off the edge into space. 
I'm like, they're space dragons. Yes, I was just going to say, who doesn't love space dragons? That's so cool. Mm. Oh, it's just nice. It's a good ending. Like, and I mm. think you know, after some of the early ones, which we keep, we've said this a lot that they don't have such great pace. The romance in them doesn't feel right. Um, sometimes the endings feel quite abrupt. This did not feel like that at all. Like, like it had a really great climax and a really lovely set of sort of aftermath scenes mm. that I, I just, I just such good pace, so good. And the subplots work together really well in this one, and I think particularly in some of the early ones. Obviously, the subplots are serving a purpose, but they can feel a bit clunky at times, mm. whereas this is very very smooth, I think. and Yeah, yeah everything ties in together. Yeah. It no, feels no. like it was post-it notes on a wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Considered. yeah. Let's write this using a Kanban board. Mm. <laughs> I'm sure he would have used Scrivener if it had been available at the time. Oh, he probably had a prototype of that. He was all across that kind of That's thing. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I'm sure he would have. Um, all right, yeah. should we do favorite quotes and footnotes and then questions? Yeah, are there any any favorite bits that you'd like to share, Amy? Um, that we haven't already covered. I there's there's a few descriptions of Sybil I really like, and obviously, again, you get a lot of like nature things and mountains, and I'm you know prows of ships, which is a nature and whatever. But there's a line where she's just described as one massive angry proto woman. Yes. And I just love that line so much. It makes me, it makes me extremely happy. Can I just say my favorite line is on the same page as yours directly oh, below that. Well, there you go. Oh, wow. What's yours? Um, the inmates already as highly strung as a harp on amphetamines. We're going mad. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty yes. amazing. No, that is, that is excellent. One of my favorite interactions is when Nobby and Carrot are patrolling together and Nobby completely misunderstands Carrot's reasons for coming to the watch. Yes. And he's yep. talking about how, you know, he doesn't understand that he's like, you know, he's living in a brothel with a bunch <laughs> of sex workers and sleeping there every night. And Nobby's like, every night? And he's like, yeah, but I came to the city to get a man made of me. <laughs> he says, I don't think I should like to live where you come from. <laughs> like, yeah. I love how he's like Mrs. Palm and all her lovely daughters and he'll have, she'll have to provide dowries for all of them. And oh, he's so yeah. innocent. <laughs> yeah. But then he starts like he's by the end of the book, because in every one of his letters, he mentions Minty, the dwarf that he always used to get in trouble, except for the last one, where she's yeah. not mentioned at all. And I thought that was interesting. But also he talks about how he's being taught the ways of courtship and how he's going to go. And he's already been on two dates with Reet mm. because he shows her around the city looking at ironwork and she says like, oh, you're not like any of the other boys. <laughs> They're going to go to the coronation together. And then at the end, he's talking about how he's going to see her again. And it's, I'm just like, I kind of want to see where that go. Like, I think that that sounds really sweet. You mm. can just imagine this girl who's like, you know, been living in the shades and putting up with all these jerks for all this time. And then here's this impressionable young lad from the country who completely just takes her at face value and, and likes her and doesn't understand even what she does. And so she's got this opportunity to just be herself. Uh, and he's just like, that sounds great. I want to know more about Reet, but we never get to meet her. No. It's a shame. It is a shame. Mm. Yeah. I mean, obviously I am also personally particularly drawn to the rules of the librarians of time and oh, space. Would so. you like to um would you like Certainly. to read those out for us? The three rules of the librarians of time and space are one, silence. Two, books must be returned no later than the last date shown. And three. Do not interfere with the nature of causality. <laughs> those are good rules. But also my favourite thing about you reading those out was how guilty Liz looks <laughs> during the second rule. Because where, where did you get your copy of Guards, Guards from, Liz? Look, just because it's from the library and it's overdue, I, I have to confess, it's, as soon as I came into the room and Amy was here, I was like, oh, you're a librarian. May I please like have a confessional with you? <laughs> <laughs> this book I'm holding is overdue. And whose library is it from? It was from the. I shouldn't. It's on the record. They'll come for me. No, I was just saying it's from <laughs> it's from Amy's library where Amy works. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's so many there's so many good footnotes. But I think my favorite one that we haven't already mentioned uh, is possibly. I mean, there's the one about how much veterinary hates mimes. Oh yeah, that's one of mine. Um, ah, that's yes. pretty good. Do you want to read that one? Yeah, I do. So it was said he would tolerate absolutely anything apart from anything that threatened the city and mime artists. It was a strange aversion, but there you are. Anyone in baggy trousers and a white face who tried to ply their art anywhere within Ang's crumbling walls would very quickly find themselves in a scorpion pit, on one wall of which was painted the advice, learn the words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, it's so cruel. I, you know, oddly though, I know a lot of clowns, but I don't think I know any 
mimes. Um, but if there are any mimes listening, learn the words. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no, you don't have to learn. There are what no are they going to do? That's Tell you point. off? <laughs> uh, there, there aren't any words to learn. They're all trapped in little glass cases anyway. They, they can't come at you. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> One of the ones that made me laugh was uh, when the the crowd's talking about sacrificing someone to the dragon and uh, one says, nothing wrong with human sacrifice per se for proper religious reasons and using condemned criminals and so on. And then there's a footnote. A number of religions in Ankh-Morpork Pork still practiced human sacrifice, except they didn't really need to practice anymore because they had got so good at it. City law said that only condemned criminals should be used. But that was all right, because in most of the religions, refusing to volunteer for sacrifice was an offence punishable by death. <laughs> <laughs> like in very, pyramids very ankh more porky yes yes it's very pyramidy all right uh, but there's so many good ones we don't have time to read them all but i think it might be time liz for us to answer some questions because we got loads for this episode um yeah but we'll have to we won't be able to get to them all so i'm gonna have to choose a cross section i'm so i'm sorry to anyone whose question doesn't get it's all right we'll do our answered. best here's a fun one from a chew and sneezed it seems a perennial question now but who would you cast in a film of the book especially sybil ramkin so let's just let's just do sybil would you want to tell us who yours is brienne of tarth Oh. From Game of Thrones. So she's just this amazing... Gwendolyn Christie. Gwendolyn Christie, yeah. She is incredible, yeah. And she's, it's kind of a similar also, role in some ways. Yeah, and she, I think she deserves another good role because, you know, in Star Wars she plays mm. Captain Phasma who basically gets bugger all to do except look impressive in really super shiny Stormtrooper armor. And she was wasted in Hunger Games. Like she just like, blink and you miss it. Who was she in Hunger Games? Because I haven't actually seen a Game it, of Thrones. So. so it was in the third film i'm not sure if it was part one or part two and she was one of the like district generals okay yeah well she's just got a really strong presence and also great comedic timing as well which she mm. just does so subtly so i think she would nail the role i don't know if i could do better than that i i really like that what about yeah. you amy is it i have to admit like knowing who like putting faces to names as actors is actually really really not one of my strong points mm. i don't know maybe someone with like a little bit of like a dawn frenchish kind of vibe huh mm-hmm. i could see that yeah. yeah i mean i think about um uh, let them eat cake the the sitcom mm, that yes. Dawn french did with uh, jennifer yeah. saunders set during the french revolution and i think yeah i can see in that kind of a frock you know yeah yeah that could work yeah all right Next question is from Anders Russell. What apparently useless but actually very helpful magical item or charm would you like to own? Oh, uh, because they do collect. They steal those all over the city. It's a plot point. They need them to fuel the dragon ritual. Um, I've always, you know, I actually have always wanted a stone with a hole worn in the middle Mm. because it's so it's it does crop up in folklore. I think not as much as in like more modern versions of the stories because there's. I forget which, I think might be the Spiderwick Chronicles is um, you, so if you hold them up, you can see fairies through them, whereas yeah. otherwise they're invisible. Um, and I just like the idea of that, that it's like, a, it's because it's a weird thing that's been formed by nature that it has magical properties. And in the book, they're kind of described as not really being magical. They're just something that people think is magical, but mm. I like those. Yeah. I, I think I would like to have one of those. Maybe in terms of not necessarily something that was in the book, but I feel like, you know, maybe some sort of talisman that would um, protect me from the attentions of the goddess Anoya. Um, that would be amazing because she's very present in my household. I kind of like, you know how they set up the noir vibe of the old watch house with the flickering neon sign, but actually it's a magical lettering. Yeah, yeah. I kind of like one of those letters because it's like a glow stick that never goes out, right? <laughs> so it'd be there quite a, a handy glow stick thing that never goes out, to have. That- yeah. Uh, like it's and it, I assume it's not bad for the environment. So it's kind of like this yeah. good light source that you could just have around the house. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, so yeah I'm into that. Like a nightlight. Um, final question is from me, a quick one and an easy one. It's from Movie Moose. Have you listened to the audiobooks read by Tony Robinson, aka Baldrick from Blackadder? So have you? Oh, I have. Tony Robinson's one of my favourite storytellers because it. As much as people always say, you know, he's Baldrick in Blackadder. For me, I remember him most as not just one of the actors, but also as the creator and one of the writers of Maid Marian and Her Merry Men and doing the storytelling series that he used to do, which was just him telling a story, Fat Tulip's Garden. And then he did one based on the Odyssey and he did a whole set of biblical stories as well, where he went on location to Greece and then also to the Middle East and told all these stories, just talking to the camera. He's such a brilliant storyteller and his books are great. A lot of the ones that he did, the earlier ones are abridged. It's worth noting. Mm. Um, whereas there was another series of unabridged ones that were read by Nigel Planer and um, and a woman whose name I forget, Kate uh, something. I haven't listened to them for so long. Um, but yeah, his ones, are they're really good. They're really good. It's so interesting that you mentioned that to you, he's not 
the guy from Blackadder because every every time they always say Tony Robinson from Blackadder. But for me, I didn't realize he was in Blackadder for a long time. I was like, oh, and then I watched Blackadder. I was like, it's the guy from Time Team. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he is. He is also the guy from Time Team. Yeah, and that's his primary role for me. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, but um, to get to the question, no, I have not listened to the audiobooks. I'm not really an audiobook person. So, how about yeah. you, Amy? Yeah, I've listened to them. I've really liked them as well, and the um, Nigel Planer ones as well. And um, yeah, I also actually have the association, um, of Tony Robinson being a, uh, uh, Maid Marian and her Merry Men. Listen. Uh, um, Blackadder. Who even cares? <laughs> oh, I care. No, I, I care very it hurt much. Let me just say that. <laughs> yeah, I should, I should hope so. Um, I, if we've got time for one more question, um, mm. there's an interesting one from Oliver Monk, who said that in his experience, Guards Guards starts off being about carrot, then Vimes takes over, whereas Men at Arms seems to be the reverse. And do we think that was deliberate? And I actually remembered this question while I was reading it. Because I didn't feel like either of the... I, I mean, because Vimes is the first character that you meet in the book. And then even though he's not there for a little while and there's that whole bit about Carrot showing up, I didn't feel like he, he was the prime protagonist. I kind of felt like it was meant to be more of an ensemble book with Vimes being the central character that the others kind of needed because he was the one who sort of knew what he was doing. So I didn't I didn't see it that way. Mm. Um, although I think it, it does feel in Men at Arms... It is a sort of a handing on of the torch to Carrot by the end of the book. Although as we read later watch books, that's not really what happens. But what did you think about that? Yeah, I I think I'd probably sort of agree more that it's an ensemble kind of book. I, I still definitely think that it is, um, you know, Vimes who is kind of the more major character there, um, both in Guards Guards and um, throughout the other watch books as well. And I think part of that is in scenes where it's, told from Carrot's perspective or where Carrot is a major player in that scene, it's always observing him. You never really get his internal monologue or anything like to nearly the same extent as you do with Vimes. Mm. So he's always a little bit of an enigma slash to be a little bit less kind about it, not necessarily a whole lot going on there all mm. the time. And, you know, certainly doesn't have nearly as much character development as um, Vimes does. Yeah. character development <laughs> <laughs> which brings us to the end of our podcast amy thank you so much for being a guest it's been wonderful to have you thank you it's been wonderful to be here so thank you both so much um we will of course be back next month as we are every month we're going to be reading truckers <laughs> i'm going to admit right now that truckers is one of my absolute favorite pratchett books and the bromeliad trilogy is like i love it so much so, so you really like dig it <laughs> yeah oh i do i do and i just i'm gonna keep trucking on until we read all three of them uh, it's gonna be great uh, so i'm very excited not only am i excited about the book i'm also excited that we will be joined by author amy kaufman who's going to come in and talk about truckers with us now if you want to ask us questions for that episode you can use the hashtag pratchat9 on social media to get questions to us uh, and you should get those in as soon as possible if you'd want them to be answered on the podcast itself. And we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. And thank you again to all of our listeners spreading the word or rating us on iTunes or just generally telling people about us. It really does help more people to find the podcast and we really appreciate that. So thank you very much. And thank you for everyone who has appreciated my puns. I feel much less alone in the world. Uh, so until we next crawl back out of L space into the here and now, that's all from us, and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Pratchat, the monthly Terry Pratchett Book Club podcast with Pratchatters Elizabeth Flux, Ben McKenzie, that's me, and guest Amy Nichols. Pratchat is produced and edited by me with music by David Ashton of Sample and Hold Studios. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Pratchat Podcast or on the web at pratchatpodcast.com. Join the conversation for this episode using the hashtag Pratchat7A or if you must, Pratchat 8. Pratchat is brought to you by Splendid Chaps Productions. We make entertainment for your ears, like the Doctor Who podcast Splendid Chaps and time travel comedy series Night Terrace. To find out more, visit SplendidChaps.com.